Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Council Member uh, Mark Traeger, Chair of the Education Committee. I'd like to welcome you to today's joint hearing on teacher preparation and training. I'd like to thank uh, Council Member Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education and who's also a former teacher and principal and she is my education mentor here. So I wanna thank her for her leadership and for partnering with me to lead such an important conversation. Uh, studies continue to show what many of us uh, know to be true. Among school-related factors, teachers uh, matter the most uh, or matter critically for student achievement. Uh, but we know teachers do much more than help their students perform well on a test. They are also critical in promoting positive uh, social and emotional well-being and overall act as role models for our students. We're here today to learn more about how these professionals who have such a huge impact on our city's children are trained to take on this vital role. We will hopefully uh, learn about some of the shortcomings of current teacher preparation programs and have an honest conversation about how we can best address these problems in order to ensure that our uh, children, our students have the best possible teachers uh, in, their, in their classrooms. Um, our, uh, as a result, by the way, of high teacher turnover rates, especially in our highest need schools, um, thousands of New York City students are taught by a first year teacher each year. Uh, while we should be able to guarantee that these teachers are fully prepared on their first day, um, that is currently not the case. Um, also, you know, our school children come from all over the world and from all different backgrounds, and they all have unique needs. Uh, while we can say that we value these differences, it is our teachers who must substantiate and validate this claim in the classroom. But if 85% of our students are students of color, what message do we send when the majority of our teachers are not? Uh, I actually have a bill, uh, intro 1554, that will report on demographics of, uh, on, of school staff, which we'll, uh, we did have a hearing on and we'll be advancing uh, uh, in the fall. What message uh, do we send uh, when the, these diverse children, uh, these diverse children, when their teachers are also not adequately trained in culturally responsive education from their very first day in the classroom? Uh, what message do we send if, if teachers are not adequately prepared to help uh, English language learners or students with uh, uh, IEPs in city schools? Uh, matter of fact, uh, the graduation figures for L's in city schools is now about 35% of the kids graduate on time. Uh, too often we depend on professional development to better our educators and this is reflected in the millions of dollars we spend on it each year. And while this is valuable in ensuring constant growth and improvement, uh, every school day is critical for student achievement so teachers need to be effective from their first day in, in the classroom. Uh, I, as, a, as a former high school teacher myself, I remember yearning for additional pedagogy training in, in my teacher program. Um, and I am, I, I, I'm proud of, of all the schools I, I've attended and gone to, uh, but there were certainly areas that uh, I wish I could have learned more. Uh, I believe that one of the issues that I uh, saw was that there was an imbalance in terms of more content than pedagogy. I wish I, I could have received more pedagogical training than, than content uh, training during my schooling. I wish I could have reached students first day of, of, of teaching. I don't believe you could PD your way out of all these issues. Uh, PD is used to maybe reinforce something that you should have learned during your preparation program. It should not be used as a, uh, as, as a mechanism to teach you something for the first time ever. Um, if that's the case, then we have a lot of work to do. Um, I know it is our students and their parents' rights to have a fully prepared teacher uh, in their classroom from the second the first bell of the school year rings. And it is a teacher's right to know that their years of dedication to their own schooling has made them ready for that moment. 
It is these teacher preparation programs and the Department of Education's responsibility to ensure that these rights are recognized even before a teacher spends countless hours and we spend countless uh, dollars on professional development. Uh, a person who completes the requirements and is hired by our school should not want to leave after just one or two years. And there are, I know there's a variety of factors why that happens, but we, we do need, need to address uh, these issues. And that is why our conversation today is so critical. We hope to gain greater insight on these issues today from DOE, as well as from CUNY and private teacher education programs. I want to extend my thanks to you all for coming today to discuss this critical issue. In fact, I hope this hearing is just the start of a broader dialogue, and I'd like to invite the teacher preparation programs that have come out today to meet with me at a later date to continue this important uh, discussion. I also want to thank everyone who is testifying today. I want to thank the city council staff, who is incredible. We just went through a budget process, and they're still here working hard. We want to thank them all uh, for all the work that they put into today's hearing. Malcolm Buterhorn, the committee counsel, Jan Atwell, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, uh, policy analyst, Charlotte Saltzman, education intern, who's doing a great job, uh, Caitlin O'Hagan, fiscal analyst, and Chelsea Butamore, uh, Butamore, I'm sorry, financial analyst. I also want to thank my chief of staff, Anna Scaife, and my policy director, Vanessa Ogle. And of course, I want to turn it over to my uh, co-chair and colleague, council member, Inez Barron, and thank her and her staff as well. Thank you, council member Traeger. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Inez Barron. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Higher Education, and welcome to today's oversight hearing on teacher preparation and training. First, let me take this moment to give commendations to two classroom teachers that I had in my career who have made an impact not only on my education but on my life, and that would be Mrs. Ann Yearwood, who was my teacher in grades four, five, and six at PS20 in Brooklyn, and Dr. Leonard James, who was my African American history instructor when I took a sabbatical from teaching at DOE, and he was my professor at New York City Technical College. Two people who had a profound impact on my life. And I'm sure if I ask you, you could think of at least one teacher that was outstanding during your elementary school education. You never forget the impact of that teacher. It might have been your kindergarten teacher, or your first grade, or your seventh grade math, or whatever, but there's always one teacher that stands out in your mind, at least one. The Committee on Higher Education last held a hearing on, the topic, on this topic in January of 2016. At that hearing, we addressed the teacher shortage and how the city and CUNY are working to address it, as well as increase the number of teachers of color in the classroom. At that time, Arthur Levine, former president of Columbia University's Teachers College, said that at the schools that prepare teachers to teach, quote, teacher education is regarded by university professors and administrators inside and outside of the education school as one of the poorest quality campus units, end quote. In New York City, which has one of the largest and most diverse student populations in terms of race, culture, class, and ability, it is essential that we have well-educated and prepared teachers, and specifically teachers of diverse backgrounds, to ensure that we can increase student learning and academic achievement. Indeed, prep teacher preparation is one of the strongest factors in, independent, in student learning. The quality of a teacher's preparation program can have a greater impact on student outcomes than even poverty. <clears throat> Furthermore, students of color who study with a teacher of color perform three to six percentile points higher on reading and math tests than those without. However, there are increasing concerns about how well teacher education programs are preparing prospective educators for working with students in Department of Education schools. I am particularly concerned about such preparation, how such preparation may be lacking in the area of culturally responsive education. Moreover, despite the significant representation of students of color in DOE schools, teachers of color are significantly underrepresented. If, if teachers are to be effective, they must be sure that they are sensitive to and address the various expressions of intelligences such as described by Garner and include visual and spatial, verbal and linguistic, logical and mathematical, 
bodily and kinesthetic, musical, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and naturalist. Teachers must help children realize and utilize their metacognitive styles. Equally important, teachers must fully be cognizant of the stages of child development. White educators account for more than half of the teacher population on average in every borough but the Bronx, where the average ratio fell just below 50% from 2015 to 2016. And more than half of all Brooklyn school teachers are white in the 2015-16 school year, although white students comprised 18% of the student population. Yet the totals of black, Latino, and Asian students all surpass their educator counterparts. On June 1st, June 11th, the mayor, together with Chancellor Richard Carranza, endorsed a series of recommendations offered by the School Diversity Advisory Group. Of the 62 recommendations meant to improve diversity in New York City public schools, only six focused on the teachers. Now, with a new CUNY chancellor, whom I'm looking forward to meeting, I look forward to hearing CUNY's plan to increase and improve teacher education. In particular, I'm interested in an update on New York City Men Teach, an initiative that was recently launched to support the preparation, recruitment, and professional development of 1,000 men of color across nine CUNY campuses. From both CUNY and the private institutions that are here today, I'm interested in learning how you are working to increase, one, the number of teachers, particularly number of black teachers. Two, ensure teachers receive appropriate training and preparation. And three, increase the number of teachers of color in the DOE schools. I want to acknowledge my colleagues from the Higher Education Committee who are present, Councilmember Maisel, Councilmember Rodriguez. And I also want to thank Joy Simmons, my Chief of Staff, Indigo Washington, my CUNY liaison and Director of Legislation, Chloe Rivera, the Committee's Policy Analyst, Paul Senegal, Counsel to the Committee, and Michelle Perrigan, the Committee's Finance Analyst. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And I also just want to recognize all the members who are here. I, I see also we've been in some overlap. Uh, Council Member Gordentra, Council Member Mizell, Council Member Lander, uh, Council Member Cornegie, Council Member Rodriguez, Council Member Drum, Council Member Rose, and Council Member Borelli. Um, and I believe uh, we'll now have the, the first panel uh, be called up and we'll have them sworn in. Is that right? Uh, we have Thomas uh, Hanna, uh, Chief Human Capital uh, DOE, uh, Rod Bowen, Senior Executive Director, Teacher Development, and uh, Amy Way, Senior Executive Director, Teacher Recruitment. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Please state your names for the record. Amy Way. Tomas Hanna. Rod Bowen. Thank you so very much. Good afternoon, Chairs Traeger and Barron, and members of the Committees on Education and Higher Education. My name is Tomas Hanna, and I'm the Chief Human Capital Officer at the New York City Department of Education. I'm joined by Rod Bowen, Senior Executive Director of the Office of Teacher Development within the Office of the Chief Academic Officer, and I'm joined by Amy Way, Senior Executive Director for Teacher Recruitment and Quality. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss the critically important issue of strengthening our teaching workforce in this venue. Since this is my first time before council, I'm very appreciative of it. I would like to share a little bit about my background. As an educator with more than 25 years experience, I've had the pleasure of serving school communities in two large urban districts, including New York City since 2011. I have served in a variety of school-based roles, such as substitute teacher, teacher and principal, as well as a deputy and associate superintendent, and other senior leadership roles in central offices. The quality and retention of our teachers are core components of Chancellor Carranza's priority to develop people and the city's equity and excellence agenda for all as a whole. We are deeply committed to supporting the growth and development of our teachers, from pre-service 
from pre-service training to in-service professional learning, and we've made unprecedented investments and implemented a number of new initiatives. As a result, we have a holistic set of support systems for every teacher from before they enter the classroom through their entire career. For example, we have increased peer-to-peer -peer teacher support and transformed our educator's career ladder into a career lattice with nearly 2,000 new teacher leader positions in our schools. We have created new innovative pathways and strategies to increase teacher retention and strengthen resources in our historically underserved communities through the Bronx Plan, our Teaching Fellows Program, and 80 new teacher preparation academies. We have developed the new teacher development facilitator positions in the United Federation of Teachers contract, establishing leaders who provide ongoing support to teachers during their pre-service training. And through the NYC Men Teach Initiative, we have increased the diversity of our teaching force. Over 1,000 men of color have entered the teaching pipelines since that effort started just three years ago. As a result of these and other initiatives, overall teacher retention and new teacher retention across New York City public schools remain consistently higher than national averages. And in recognition of our investments in teacher leadership and professional development opportunities, in 2017, the National Council on Teacher Quality named the New York City Department of, Ed of Education as a great district for great teachers. While we are pleased by our progress, we know there is more work to do to ensure that all new teachers are well prepared and trained. The DOE has a workforce of approximately 80,000 teachers serving students from birth to grade 12 in district schools and NYC early education centers. As a system, we welcome approximately 5,000 new teachers into our schools every year. All newly hired teachers in New York City public schools are prepared through schools of education, and we depend on the traditional pathways at institutions of higher education to prepare most of our new hires every year. We recruit from over 100 universities nationwide and are more deeply involved with a smaller subset of primarily local institutions of higher education. Over 60% of our new hires graduated from and received their pre-service teacher preparation at New York State public and private universities. Over 30% of our new hires graduated from a university in the CUNY system. Helping aspiring educators transition to our schools requires a strong partnership with the UFT, higher education institutes, and the New York State Department of Education. Together, we've strengthened student teacher preparation requirements so that our newest educators are better prepared to enter and succeed in the field. DOE has multiple touch points with these key partners, including quarterly steering meetings, committee meetings, and monthly meetings with the UFT, institutions of higher education, and NYSET. I want to share several key steps we are taking with our partners to improve teacher preparation. Number one, increase the number of teacher candidates prepared to teach in our schools aligned to our subject area needs. We have engaged universities in a shared vision for teacher preparation, called the Criteria for New Teacher Readiness. These are the skills and knowledge that we expect every New York City teacher to have prior to entering our classrooms. Through the DOE's grant-funded Teacher Preparation Transformation Center, we are collaborating with preparation programs at three universities, Lehman College, Brooklyn College, and Toro College around these criteria. Part of this work is also building upon current initiatives to increase recruitment in hard to staff categories such as teaching special education students and multilingual learners. We are proud that we've been able to work with our partners to create subsidized teaching programs in these areas through the subsidized bilingual extension program and the secondary students with disabilities certification program in addition to the teaching fellows program and the Bronx plan. Two, second, expand clinical experiences to provide meaningful and genuine opportunities to practice skills with our students in our schools. We are working with the National Center for Teacher Residencies and US Prep, two nationally renowned leaders in residency-based teacher preparation to increase the amount of student teaching and clinical preparation candidates receive before entering the classroom. We had 500 pre-service teachers trained through a half-year residency this year and are looking to strengthen and expand these efforts. 
Additionally, in partnership with key stakeholders across the state, we successfully lobbied, lobbied NYSED to change regulations to require prospective teachers to spend more time in DOE schools for student teaching prior to graduating from their programs. Those regulation changes significantly increased the required student teaching time to one semester from the previous requirement of 40 days. Third, culturally responsive sustaining education. Chancellor Carranza is making culturally responsive sustaining education a cornerstone in everything we do. Students must see themselves in the lessons we teach, and that is why we are expanding our culturally responsive sustaining curriculum options and in-service trainings, as well as putting forward the first unified definition of culturally responsive sustaining education in DOE history. In addition, we are working with our higher education partners to infuse more culturally responsive and implicit bias content into their curricula in order to better prepare their graduates to teach New York City public school students. Before I turn it over to my colleague Rob Bowen, who will speak about the experience of, of teachers after they are hired, I would like again to thank the New York City Council Committees on Education and Higher Education for the opportunity to speak today. We appreciate your shared recognition of how important this work is. A single teacher can have an enormous impact on the lives of many students. There is much work to do, and together we have the momentum to build upon the progress we've made to advance equity and excellence for all New York City students. Thank you. Rob? Thank you, Tomas. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger, Chair Barron, and members of both the New York City Council Committee on Education and Higher Education. My name is Rod Bowen, and I serve as the Senior Executive Director of the Office of Teacher Development, which is within our new Chief Academic Office as part of the Division of Teaching and Learning. I come to this role having been a classroom teacher, a founding principal of an arts high school in the Bronx, and the leader of the Office of School Quality. That last role in particular put me in hundreds of classrooms observing teaching from kindergarten through 12th grade across our city, and I bring that understanding of the strengths and challenges that exist in our classrooms to my current role. Great teachers are the cornerstones of great schools, and I would like to discuss the strategies we use to support the growth and development of our teachers as they can better serve our 1.1 million students. Our chief academic office, led by Dr. Linda Chin, is leading essential work across the divisions of teaching and learning, multilingual learners, and specialized instruction and student supports to provide all schools with the resources and professional, professional learning necessary to create inclusive, rigorous instruction for every child in a safe, welcoming, and aff affirming environment. As part of this effort, the focus of the office that I lead is to support the growth and development of our teachers so they can ultimately sustain a long-term and successful career in our schools. As a system, our professional development efforts are wide-ranging and available in many different forms to meet needs of each district and school. Across the department, including academics and the borough citywide offices, teams organize opportunities for thousands of teachers to learn and share targeted content-specific classroom practices. Generally, these events are focused on the use and implementation of curricula and pedagogical approaches and provide valuable learning for our teachers as well as opportunities for them to continue to grow and develop. In addition, we know that our newest teachers need ongoing targeted support and development. That is why even before their first school year begins, new teachers are invited to three days of professional learning which introduced them to the expectations of the New York City schools, along with the supports and resources available to them. This fall, for the first time, this training will be required for all new teachers. After teachers attend this new teacher week, they, uh, they participate in our new teacher mentoring program. All teachers receive a trained mentor upon entering their school. This is important because research shows that when teachers receive ongoing school-based support, from an experienced and talented mentor, they are more likely to be satisfied on the job as well as teach long term. Each year we train 600 new teacher mentors and there are now 3,500 mentors citywide. In order to sustain the long term growth of educators and drive school wide improvement, teachers and school leaders continue to come together for 80 minutes of rigorous weekly professional development, a key result of our 2014 contract with the United Federation for Teachers. During this time, school teams engage in deep work around targeted professional learning focused on the specific needs and strengths of each school. As Tomas already, uh, already mentioned, 
Teacher development goes hand in hand with our equity and access for all agenda. The mayor and chancellor's plan to put all students on the path to college and meaningful careers. Teachers who are willing to step up and expand their classroom practices are central to this mission. For example, there are teachers being developed to teach new advanced placement courses, computer science courses, and implement a college-going culture at their schools. These 21st century sk teaching skills are essential for putting all students on the path to success. We are committed to continuous improvement, and in particular, we are focused on strengthening our university partnerships, as well as the culturally responsive, sustaining pedag pedagogy of every educator, so that they can leverage the knowledge of their students' identities and diversity as assets in the classroom. These elements of our work will be essential to the long-term success of our students, our schools, and our communities. Thank you for your partnership and for the opportunity to testify before you today. We will be happy to answer any questions you may have for us. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, and, and also just to note for, for, for the public, I, I will at some point soon have to uh, turn it over to my co-chair to, to run the full hearing because my niece is graduating high school today and I am in big trouble if I don't make it. Uh, so I will ask some key questions, do some follow-up, but I will be reading all uh, testimony. My staff will be here. Uh, this is a topic of great importance to me, both professionally and personally, you know, on behalf of the children of New York City, and so I will be following up from this, and I want to thank my co-chair for, for her leadership and for accommodating uh, th this day for me. I, I just want to just have a, a, some quick questions. Just Yes, I mentioned we've been joined by Councilmember Drum. Yes, absolutely. Um, just want to ask first, does, uh, what are the most common PD requests made by newly hired teachers in our school system? Does, does someone keep track of that over in, in the DOE? Well, we do survey uh, new teachers at the end of the year and um, classroom management comes up a lot. Um, and we tend to just make sure that we're focusing on it, just student engagement, which can take many forms. So student engagement and classroom uh, management. Uh, so you're saying that the DOE provides a survey to newly hired teachers, is that correct? Yep. We do. Uh, we uh, survey new teachers at about the six week period when they're with us. And um, yes, uh, we ask and them how, how things are going for them and at the end of the year as well. And so what are, so you mentioned classroom management as one. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other uh, items uh, or areas of concern er, or areas for growth that teachers are requesting help with? A couple of areas would be working with multilingual learners, as you called out earlier in, when we started, and uh, working with students uh, who have IEP, students with disabilities, to try to um, sort of meet, meet their needs. And how long has the DOE been uh, conducting this, this survey with newly hired teachers? Amy? We've conducted this survey for about three years, but we can confirm that for you as a follow-up. Yeah, because I, I don't remember filling out that survey, but I did teach a while ago, uh, so it's been over five, five years. Um, it's interesting because some of the areas that you mentioned, classroom management, uh, I was taught uh, that uh, if there's an issue with classroom management, that means that there are gaps in the lesson plan. Uh, there's an old expression, if, if you f fail to plan, then you plan to, f to fail, right? And so uh, if, th there's, if each minute is not planned accordingly, there could be gaps, and that's when some management issues uh, might occur, but that's a part of pedagogy training. Uh, working with students, uh, multilingual learner students, uh, I was in that situation where a first-year teacher assigned to a bilingual class, and it was challenging for me. Um, and uh, so some of you who know me know that I like to like to talk at times. Uh, it's, it's too teacher-centric, I get that, but um, it's hard to teach when the majority of your students in front of you um, speak a language other than English in the classroom, and I don't speak their language. And so I was sent to a number of PDs, but as I mentioned in my opening remarks, you can't PD your way out of all these issues. Uh, I 
wish I could have received more training in terms of how to uh, reach my students before I stepped foot in, into the classroom. And uh, I learned the most effectively when I observed veteran teachers who I was very fortunate to work with. And uh, I want to thank our experienced veteran educators in our school system who don't get enough thanks, in my opinion, uh, who mentored this younger, this new teacher who came into the building. And through those observations, I took that, those practices back into my classroom. Um, how, does the, how does the results on that survey inform your work with the teaching preparatory institutions? We, so we, ha as we said in testimony, we actually meet regularly with, with our partners and engage them. And here's what we're learning from the field. What might you be able to do to, to, to sort of fill those gaps, as, as it were? I'd also share that we, we also share with you that that information we also provide internally to executive superintendents, to superintendents, to principals, so that they too can plan their work in their buildings to be sure that they're filling those gaps as well. So we are sharing the information. Is that data publicly available? We, we have kept that data we've been using internally to inform our partners sort of in a more intimate setting um, because we think that's, that, that's a really strong way to, to ensure that we're, we're being open and honest and transparent with, with them so that they get what they need so that they can make the changes necessary. I mean, I, I'm respectful of uh, privacy, names, information, but certainly I think the common areas are of great public interest. Yeah, so if that could be shared with our committees, I would greatly appreciate that just the common areas that are, in, that are in need uh, of additional addressing. Very well. um, also, in addition to teacher surveys, um, you know, you have supervisors, whether assistant principals or principals, observing new teachers. I'm curious to know how the DOE works with school leaders uh, on their feedback. They have the power to issue observation reports. That's a part of their, their requirements. I'm curious to know, are there commonalities that we're seeing in observation reports uh, made by supervisors to, to new teachers and how that's being addressed by the DOE. So my office is responsible for uh, working with a group of folk who go, whose role is to go out into the field and, and train principals on how to give quality feedback and how to take advantage of the advanced system to not only be an evaluative piece but a, a development, developmental experience with teachers. And so um, that's ongoing work. There's so many principals throughout the system who are at various levels of experience. Um, and I would just name that one of the things that we are making a concerted effort to work with them is with the quality of their feedback. Making sure that when a teacher, regardless of their level of experience, reads that report, that they're very clear on what their next steps are for improvement. So I, I appreciate that answer. And if I heard you correctly, these mentors uh, or folks work with the principals on how to provide quality feedback to, to, new, teachers. to, to teachers. Yes. My question is, what quality feedback are they bringing back to DOE saying, look, these are the common areas that we're, we, that we're being asked to address in these schools across the city. Um, what can we do better to provide more support to them and also to future educators? Uh, is that information also being shared with your teaching preparatory institutions? I want to make sure I understand the question. Right. You're asking what feedback are we getting from principals? Correct. Um, that's a great question. I, my response is that they're deep, deepening their understanding around the use of Danielson Framework for Teaching, which is our uniform tool for development and evaluation, is the big ask. And, and constantly norming and deepening their understanding of that, that tool has been, um, has been an ask on their part. And there's been a lot of appreciation for looking at something they've been seeing for years and seeing it with a new lens. That's the ongoing work of coaching um, in the schools with, with these team of, of uh, coaches. And so just a, a better understanding of the tool and the work moving forward is to tr work to ensure that teachers, including new teachers, are also using that same tool to, as a tool for self-development and not just see it as something that's evaluative. Right. Because I, 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 I speak to folks in the field still. I'm, I still speak to my teacher colleagues. I have you know, friends and folks who work as principals, assistant principals across the city. And anecdotally, what they're telling me is what I'm hearing today, that a lot of the new staff need help in areas of teaching. Multilingual learners need help in terms of recognizing students' needs and how to best accommodate their needs uh, in the classroom. And I just feel that this has been a conversation that we're having over and over and over again and how we're kind of breaking the cycle. Um, and so my question also is, 
in addition to working with our teaching preparatory institutions, has there been sort of more uh, of an intense look at the coursework and the materials um, in these teaching preparation programs? Because one of the things, and I, I want to again state, I love my experience. I had great professors, I had a great, great time. But I do believe if, if, if you ask for my feedback, um, I had content training here, pedagogy training here. I wish, quite frankly, I had a bit more pedagogy training here, and, and I love history. I will always, I'm a student of history, but it's hard to teach history when you can't reach your kids. Uh, and so has there ever been sort of like a, uh, an analysis done by the coursework, whether it's CUNY or whether it's private institutions, to kind of you know, identify best practices that could be shared across the board, across all institutions, if you could speak to that. Um, so I'd be happy to jump in on this. So we have a set of partnerships with higher education that are convened by national partners. Tomas mentioned U.S. Prep and National Center for Teaching Residencies. Both of these partners are supporting DOE and higher education to have exactly the conversation that you just mentioned. What is anchoring that conversation is a criteria for new teacher readiness, which is something that we've developed recently in this administration in response to very much what you've said around our new teachers not necessarily having the opportunity to develop the skills to support our students. And so the focus of the criteria includes um, some elements of Danielson and then other areas that we're calling the connected practices. And that tool came out of conversations and looking at information and understanding what should we be doing to make clearer to our partners what's important to DOE. And so we think that this is just the beginning of that work through those partnerships, but that, that vision allows us to have a common ground around what readiness looks like and when looking at curricula and other elements to be able to say, where are we seeing the development of skills that are aligned to this work? Now, do you feel that uh, state regs and state mandates are sufficient as far as what's required of teachers to obtain in their quest to obtain a teaching license. Like for example, in the DOE, I know that the DOE is required by the state to teach a certain number of hours of physical education and, and, and health and so forth. Do you feel that there are, are sufficient requirements uh, in terms of state mandates, in terms of uh, teaching preparatory uh, coursework? So New York State is a very important partner in our preparation of teachers, and I had the pleasure of serving on a committee to revisit the clinical preparation regulations, um, and that led to having us extend the number of student teaching um, days from 40 days to half a semester that Tomas spoke about in his testimony. What we think there is opportunity, you know, there's opportunity for growth and work with, hi with higher ed and New York State around those regulations. I think our partners would agree that we need to look at the suite of what is required within those regulations, that we've done some good work looking at advancing the student teaching component, but we could be looking at the full package together and understanding ways to um, potentially revise I mean, for example, are there certain amounts of hours required or coursework required for special education? Regardless if my license is in special education, everyone should have a general understanding because I was required to teach an ICT class and I have a gen ed license, but I should know the needs of all my kids. I don't look at kids whether they're gen ed or special, they're all my children, but I wish I could have received more training on how to best meet all of their needs. But is, are, is there a requirement in, st in, state, in state regs that require institutions to teach a certain num number of hours or courses in special education? Uh, can you speak to that? So I, I can speak to it, but I think it's also a good question for our partners and higher. I will be, at, yeah, so sure. We, yes. um, <laughs> so there recently, New York State did increase the number of hours for student, for student teachers to prepare um, in the areas of multi literacy for multilingual learners, and there are other baseline requirements, but I think this is part of the review that we would be excited to do in conjunction with New York State and higher ed would be to say, what do we know about the needs of our students? What do we think our teachers need to know? And to take a hard look at those requirements. 
Right, and you mentioned that they've increased the number of field work that's required. The student, te it's student, student teaching. Student teaching. The one thing, and again, it, it, things could have changed since my time, so forgive me if, if, if I have old information, but one of the things I think would be helpful is structuring that field work more. Because sometimes I've heard from folks that they might, kn they might know a friend in the system that they'll observe their class and do teach student teaching with. That's great, but quite frankly, if I could redo my time, uh, and I, I worked in, I visited a number of schools, but I probably would have spent a lot more time with teachers who are seasoned and experienced in teaching multilingual learners or, or teachers who are teaching ICT classes. I didn't know I was gonna get assigned those classes, so I, I didn't know in advance. Is, is there any effort to kind of make that field work more structured in terms of they can't just pick anybody in the school system, they should be working a certain number of hours and days with certain types of educators, if, if that makes sense. Yep. So the quality of those teacher educators, whether they're within higher ed or within our schools is very important. That's why we've recently negotiated the teacher development facilitator in our U of T contract. The intention behind that role is to create some level of kind of uh, standardization across those roles where we can say, you know, who is selected for those positions, how are they trained, how are they supported, and we see a lot of opportunity in that new element in our contract. The new state regulation also requires training of teacher educators, and so I think that would get at some of what um, you were mentioning, but we are just at the beginning of implementing that new regulation. It doesn't go into, um, it was just voted on and approved by the regents this spring. All right, I just have a couple more and I'll turn over to my co-chair. In August 2013, the DOE released uh, Teacher Preparation Program Reports, TPPR, analyzing the effectiveness of teacher preparation programs based on the, quali quote, quality, distribution, and retention of new teacher hires, end quote, who graduated from such programs. The TPPR provided an analysis of graduates from the 12 uh, teacher preparation programs that supplied the most educators to New York City public schools between 2008 and 2012. Since that initial 2013 release, DOE has not publicly released TPPR data. Does DOE still compile and track TPPR data? If not, why not? So under Chancellor Freenia's administration, we made a shift to be more collaborative with institutes of higher ed. So we stepped away from having the public reports released and instead we share information through our partners. Um, and so that's work that we do in conjunction with the national partners I mentioned in the monthly and quarterly convenings that we have with CUNY and other education partners. We look at information around our overall pipeline and how, um, who's hired, what are some of the um, problems that we need to solve around that pipeline together. But those conversations happen in conjunction with those, that partnership rather than through a public um, report. Uh, but would you agree that that report contains uh, policy and budgetary implications? If I recall, the report did not show much differentiation across the institutions, so I think for our purposes, we find that the partnership work is um, a much more meaningful way to advance the conversation. Right, I mean, I, I would just respectfully disagree and say that um, as policymakers, we wanna always improve policy, and if there's budgetary needs, we need to increase supports for DOE or our higher ed. And so, because quite frankly, a lot of this conversation will require in the end more resources to better meet the needs of, of our kids, and I get that. But certainly we need to know where we're falling short or, where, or, or who has something that is worth pursuing and sharing with, with other partners. And so I, I do believe that this is a result of, I think, those federal legislation or mandates passed down to require some sort of reporting on, on teaching preparatory institutions but I do think that there are budgetary and policy implications that we need to, especially if you're confirming to us today that there are areas that we need to continue to grow teachers in, we need to know. Um, we need to know that. And we need to figure out how to always strive for improvement and add more resources, you know. And so I, I would request that the DOE go back and reevaluate that decision, at least to share it with the city council because we are partners in the budget process and we could make an impact uh, in, in, this, in this area. 
Uh, according, I'm just following up on the TPPR, according to the DOE's press release, the TPPR was compiled as a first step for the city and university education programs to open a dialogue aimed at developing a long-term strategy to improve preparation for aspiring teachers before they ever step into a DOE classroom. Um, what can you share with us now about that dialogue? If it, you're saying it, it happens, what can you share with us now concretely that has changed as a result of this dialogue? Sure. So we are actively engaging in conversations about the design of the curriculum within um, teacher preparation. We are engaging in um, ways to align around our vision for teacher educators. What, does, what should we value in those individuals who are either hosting student teachers or teaching um, courses? And we are sharing the criteria for new teacher readiness and providing supports to higher education to be able to make adjustments to their curriculum. So we are really proud of the work that's underway. You know, this is complex work. Teaching is a challenging profession and we wanna bring um, all groups together in order to make these improvements. Right. Um I, uh, one last follow-up, and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn over to my co-chair. Um, with regards to professional development for new teachers, is there any type of quality review that's conducted for the providers of that PD since many teachers require extensive PD over and over again? So can you speak to that? And how does the DOE evaluate the performance of the PD that's being offered and provided to new teachers, and have changes been made if providers, you know, were not doing an adequate job? Yeah, I'll start. So just to name that, uh, PD is offered not simply to new teachers, but to all teachers on various levels. We have district level PD, we have central PD, and we have school-based PD. Um, I can speak for the PD that my office actually um, facilitates, and we provide, uh, again, kind of surveys and evaluations um, that we look at the data and analyze at quarterly to, to inform how we move forward with similar PD that we're gonna offer moving forward. That's just one example. Um, I can't speak to what the various other um, parts of our organization do in terms of um, collecting feedback and data on their, on their professional learning at this point. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I, I know that the state mandates for in order for teachers to get their license and to maintain their license, they, they mandate a certain number of hours yes. of PD to renew and to, ref to refresh their license. I get that. I'm talking about the certain PD where is targeted PD, where teachers and school communities are saying, I need help in these areas. And I know that teachers are evaluated, schools are being evaluated, but who's evaluating the folks who are supposed to prov provide the support, and whether it's working or not? Are there surveys for that? And how is that in data informing your decision whether to continue that PD provider or find a new PD provider. I'm just curious to know how, how this works. So I would say the, the singular consistent means of supporting new teachers is the supervision and support they get from their supervisor. That is across the board taking place in every school. There is no external provider who's giving professional learning for teachers across the system. So we have lots of means of accountability and quality control for that. Um, when I say that, I mean the quality of feedback that, he, that they're getting from their supervisors. Um, but again, there's no other um, uniform, coherent way of providing support to all teachers. I, I guess I'm gonna put my UFT delegate hat on for a yep. second, because I worked in a very large high school, a lot of kids, mm -hmm. overcrowded, and my department had over 25, 26 teachers in it. Very hard for my assistant principal to provide meaningful one-to-one -one support to every single teacher in that department especially when he had to observe us a number of times. And so I am mindful of my educator family that it's, not, it's a very tough job. Um, and so to put it just on one AP or one principal is, is not fair either. They certainly, that's part of their job is to provide ongoing support. But I do remember being sent to, an, you know, I, I asked for a certain number of PD supports and my, my question was some of it was useful, some of it, quite frankly, the, the muffins were better than the PD. Uh, and, but I, I wish I could have had better training in some of them. So I'm just, this is a conversation I'd like to kind of mm -hmm. follow up on with the DOE, but I'll, I'll pause here and turn it over to my, uh, my pa very patient colleague and co-chair, Councilman Barron. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilman Traeger. 
Thank you to the panel for coming. I just have a few questions because I know there may be other members who want to ask questions as well. So to follow up on the questions that Councilmember Traeger asked about the teacher preparation program report, is it your position that that report should not be made public? And I asked that question in terms of improving transparency between what's going on at the DOE and having people in the public know what's going on at the DOE. I would say we, we want the information to, to have an impact. And so the, the relationship we have with, with our partners is one that, that we value, right? We have, as we said earlier, we, it's partnerships, universities, the DOE, and, and our university. So we think that there's an opportunity to use that data uh, to, to, see, to see improvement. Um, I do think to the, to the recommendation around sort of like what are the patterns, right? Um, I think there's an opportunity to sort of engage in that kind of conversation, like what, what to, to, to the point earlier, what are the conversations that are happening and what's actually changing? So I think there's an opportunity, you know, uh, to be able to do that. So do you think that that partnership that exists, as I hear you uh, describing it between the DOE and the schools of uh, training, teacher training, that's sufficient to just have those two partners? Or are there other partners uh, that I, have a more public uh, public input? I didn't mean to interrupt, I apologize. Um, I, I, I don't, it's not, it's not just the DOE and the partners alone sort of figuring this out. I, I, so who are the other partners? The partner it would be schools, would be principals, would be executive superintendents, would be teachers themselves, could be our partners at, at the UFT who've engaged in, 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 in doing professional development as well. So being able to, sh to share what we're learning about that with sort of a broader group of folks would, would I think would help, would position us better to be sure that we're meeting, that we're meeting the needs. Would that partnership also include parents in some capacity? I, I, I absolutely. Would. How how are they a part of that partnership? Well, how how would they be? How would they be? Would be how it is that sort of we we, we would share the information. Certainly, schools would have a sense. So, of are they actually now at this point a part of the partnership? I guess that's a more precise question. I don't. I, Rod, I'm going to turn it over. I don't know. I think this is a coming out of an administration that purposely um, pulled away from sharing information publicly. I think we're in a different time where we can definitely take the idea under consideration that we'd be more inclusive around the information that, that we're sharing in that particular report. Okay, great. I think that that would be important. Thank you, Rod. Um, and then in your testimony, you indicated that um, all newly hired teachers have come through an education training. Uh, all newly hired teachers are prepared through schools of education. Is that, is that correct? correct? So is, does that also apply to teachers who come through Teach for America or teaching fellows programs? that they have been prepared, and if so, to what degree? And I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Members Ulrich, who's a member of the Higher Education Committee, and Council Member Kalos. Yes, so back to the question, those who come through the Alternative Teacher yes. Program. Yes, so all alternative certification programs also have a component where those participants are engaging in teacher preparation coursework. They do some portion of that before they start as educators, and then they complete it in an ongoing capacity, usually over two to three years. So before they begin teaching, what is the extent of the preparation that they have? So it depends on the program, but based on the regulations from um, New York State for transitional B certificates, which um, all of those teachers are teaching under that credential, um, there's an initial preparation um, which involves a number of coursework hours and time um, in kind of a student teaching like environment. And what's the extent in terms of hours before they actually are able to go into a classroom? How many hours have they uh, received this preparation before they step into a classroom in September? So I'd have to get back to you on the exact regulation, but I can tell you for our New York City Teaching Collaborative, which is one of the transitional B programs that's sponsored by the DOE, the number of hours is, it's a half a semester of 
um, supervised student teaching along with coursework before becoming a full teacher of record in the fall. But it does, it varies by program. We'll have to get back to you on the state reg. So I'm just concerned, I wanna understand uh, someone who did not complete a standard teacher education program at a college who now is in the classroom in September, I want to understand what preparation they have had, to what extent, how many hours, how many courses. There may be, so if someone graduated in May and then on June 1st decided I want to go into teaching and they have not had preparation for that, what do they get during the summer or do they have to wait and not start in September, but postpone it till February? You said, I think you said a half a semester. So I wanna understand exactly what that is. And, and just so for the record, uh, I began teaching in uh, September of 1967 without any education preparation. There was a great need for teachers at that time, and I applied, and based on my minor in psychology, those teaching education courses were waived and the psychology classes that I had taken were accepted in lieu of that. But there was of course the understanding that I had to get a master's in education, which I did and got from Bank Street and I understand Bank Street's in New York, you say? <laughs> so um, I, I understand that. I just wanna be clear as, as because your testimony as I read it would have made me think, oh, everybody who's coming into the system has been prepared and I don't know that that's actually the case. So that's why I'm going into this to find out to what extent, how many hours, how many courses before they step into the classroom. So I, the testimony does state that it's a certain portion of our new hires have completed that traditional teacher ed uh, program. The I'm talking about the phrase that says all newly hired teachers in New York City public schools are prepared through schools of education. I, in reading that at its face, I would think, oh, everybody in every classroom, the first day that they're stepping in has been, that's what I would read this to say, and I just want to be clear if, if, if that, in fact, is the case. So all teachers who begin at the DOE have completed some preparation through our higher education partners, and we are following the regulations from New York State for the transitional B certificate, which I know is not what you want to hear. I, I think what I understand. All I want to hear is what is it actually, yeah. factually, right. you know, concretely. Yeah. So That's there what I are, I think, seven different alternative pathway programs that the DOE participates in, and then any number of other registered programs okay. across New York State. I don't want so to prolong that. If there's you could, no one answer is what I'm trying to say. If you could say. get that to us yep. in some written form, uh, I would, we'll I would we'll appreciate it. Thank you. I don't want to belabor that point. Um, do my colleagues have questions? I have a list. Council Member Rodriguez, thank you. He left, Council Member Drum, followed by Council Member Borelli. Okay, great. Thank you very, very much. Welcome. Good to see you. Um, I do have some questions in regard to your testimony, um, and I believe that it was, um, I'm sorry, um, the second person who gave testimony. I'm forgetting now. I'm Rod. How are you doing? Yeah, okay. Um, in your testimony, the last second to last paragraph, you said that as well as the culturally responsive sustaining pedagogy of every educator so that they can leverage the knowledge of their students' identities and diversity. And I'm very supportive of that and very supportive of the work that the Chancellor has been doing, particularly around CRE and implicit bias. Um, so, but one of the th concerns that I do have is how are we dealing with LGBT issues and training of teachers in the schools and principals as well? Because um, I'm hearing, and, I, and I've said this to uh, LaShawn Robinson as well, that some of the teachers say that, that that issue is not being addressed even in the implicit bias and in the um, culturally responsive education. So do you know how that issue is being addressed um, with those programs and other programs or anything throughout the DOE? I appreciate that question. So um, we are currently in the midst of really putting a concerted effort into CRSE. And there's no denying that when you look at the history of that, pedagogical uh, movement, it starts predominantly looking at the needs of, of ch children of color. 
However, when you look at the intent of it, it's really about making sure that the learning the kids' experience is reflective of who they are in all of their identities. So part of the expectation is not to simply stop at their racial and cultural and ethnic identities, but all of who they are, their linguistic uh, experiences and all of it. And so though there has not been, it has not been pulled out and named, it is an expectation that when done well, cultural responsiveness attaches all, uh, uh, looks at all those identity pieces. And I would also say that the reason for starting with race is because a lot of our data that we use to assess our effectiveness with our children and educating them is racialized data, right? So we talk about black and brown youth and the so-called achievement gap and so forth. And so that's why it's that starting point, but it is in no way meant to exclude all the ways in which uh, kids identify themselves. That's shocking to me. Which part? That you don't mention it. How could that be? Well, I mean, do you think that all LGBT people are white? No, not at all. I know, so what are you saying? I mean, all the LGBT people, a, a large number of them in the public school system, there's the intersectionality of that. Absolutely. So how are you addressing that? How are we addressing intersectionality? Yeah, you're saying that you don't really identify or use those words. So what I said was, and I want to I be clear, is that culturally responsive and sustaining education when done well looks at all the aspects of students' identities, all the aspects. So that is not... So Just how are you doing that? So, so I'm, I'm trying, I don't want to repeat myself for the sake of, I'm going to repeat myself for the sake of clarity. The, the reason why race is a starting point, and again, we are in the early How are you doing the LGBT? I get the race and I'm supportive. So but what are, I'm trying to not, say is how do, you, in how do you inject LGBT and the intersection thereof when you're teaching or doing, you can't do implicit bias separately and not mention LGBT. So I want to acknowledge, and then I'm going to ask uh, Tomas, so the implicit bias training, is we shouldn't conflate that with cultural responsive sustaining education. They're actually two different I understand things. that. So the implicit bias training, and Tomas, you can speak mm -hmm. to this, is talking about all types of bias, right? And that's the work that we do with all adults within our system. So how do you do it? Do you want to speak to that, Tomas? Well, we, we are, we're ensuring that, uh, as we said, having folks understand sort of their biases, where it is they're coming from, to, to take a look at themselves as they're engaging in the work. So how, <laughs> that's very vague. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, how do you talk about it? It's, it's uh, as you've heard, it's very, it's very difficult, right? There are folks who are, who are feeling, uh, in some cases, very put off because of the types of conversations that are happening. On so race is what I've heard. Well, but I've not heard that you're even discussing LGBT identities uh, with those folks either. And, and, and that's it, concerning to me, yeah. because unless you fight all of those um, prejudices um, at the same time, and, 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 and I believe this is the Chancellor's belief also, because I've had some conversations with him about this, um, you're not going to defeat that bias. You're correct, and we agree. And what I would say is that this initial series of trainings that we've been doing, we're, we're, we're identifying as foundational, right? That we're, it's but how is LGBT not a part of the foundation? It, it is, it is we, have, we, have, we are taking feedback, and we're going to address and ensure that as we move forward, how it is that we're, we're including, inclusive of all of our, of, of, of all of our, our team. Well, I find that really, really shocking. Um, we just put a million dollars into the um, DOE uh, budget. I, I was responsible for that. They're supposed to have another 500,000 in the budget for Jared um, Fox's uh, position. Um, and uh, we hope that some of that will be used for the intersectionality of, what, of the issues that you're talking about. And, and, and if I, I might say, one of the pieces that, that I neglected to mention is the fact that sexual orientation is, in fact, one of the identities that, that we engage in and that we discuss. So, so we're, 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 be, we're beginning. It's, it's, it's a beginning point conversation. Okay. I, 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 I hope that it's not yes. being left out because that's what I heard before. No. It's, it's, it's included. It's, it's, it's foundational. We are looking to, to Is it included? And it's include sexual orientation is being discussed. And what about transgender, gender identity? I, we will have to get back to in terms of like the entire curriculum of what that looks like. If that. Wow. And you're in charge of this training, but you don't know the answer. I do. I do. We do a part of it. Uh, we'll this get, is we, shocking. We, 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 we this get, is shocking we'll to me. Absolutely shocking that you can't describe to me how you're training teachers on this. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, I, it's in this, in this it's case, absolutely shocking that you would come in here and do that. 
in this day and age, knowing that we have a, a gay speaker, a gay finance chair, an LGBT caucus, that we've given you a few million dollars over the last few years, and where are the results of it? Or that it's being, you know, it's not part of the foundation. Th this is absolutely unacceptable. I'll have to meet with the chancellor on this. Do you have any LGBT people on the school diversity advisory group? I, I, right, I don't know the answer to that here, sir. You don't know the answer to that either. Wow. And Does the survey that you and, um, and, put out and include any questions on LGBT folks? It, it's, that is an, and, and I've overstepped because it's not an area that, that's re, that, that I'm responsible for doing, but as a DOE, we are responsible. I would want to be sure that the right person is going, it addresses that so that you have the answers to your question. Well, this should be system-wide. If you're here to talk about implicit bias, you, 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 you spoke about it, not me. You brought it up. And if you're here to speak about those issues and then you can't talk about it and you have to defer it to somebody else, it, it's just totally unacceptable. We look, we it's, look. it's neglect. It's educational neglect. It is. Those LGBT kids, and they're at least 10% in the school system, you're ignoring. And the teachers on top of it who are afraid to say it because you guys are not willing to do it. It's not on the survey. Is it on the pre-employment application? Do people, when they apply for a job, have an opportunity to check off um, how they identify? They have an LGBT? They have an opportunity to self-identify, as I understand. Yeah. They have what? An opportunity to self-identify. On which form? I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe on the employment form. On the employment form? Right. I believe, I, want, I have to confirm. So, we, we, t one of the issues for today was to sort of talk about the te of teacher prep, certainly, and, and the work we're doing. Yeah, but part of teacher prep would be to know how many gay teachers you have, how many gay students you have. And I had legislation, which I passed, and the mayor signed, that says you're supposed to be counting that. Are you counting that? I will, we will get back to you with that data. Do you know? I, I don't have it. How could you, as mind. the director of these programs, not know? It's not, okay. And this is unbelievable. What do you do with the principals? Do you train the principals in any of this? No, talk about principal training. And now, yeah, we're going to have to have a big time. I mean, this is, this is absolutely shocking to me. And this is a perfect example of what it is that I'm talking about. OK? And when CUNY comes up, I hope CUNY is teaching the teachers, or the prospective teachers, on these issues as well. Um, this is a definite priority for this council. We have made this very clear to the DOE. Very, very clear. And it's unacceptable that you've come in here and not be able to answer these questions. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Member John. Council Member Borelli. Uh, thank you. I want to stay on the same line of subjecting, uh, subject for a minute uh, that Council Member Drum began, because your answer, uh, Mr. Bowen, uh, to one of the questions about the implicit bias training was that we all have implicit biases and race is a starting point. Can you summarize what my implicit biases are? I don't know you, sir. So, but as, a, as an organization, the DOE assumes that we all have implicit biases and then spends money to educate teachers and faculty um, about those. Um, why is it hard to identify mine? So we all have implicit bias. You asked me what yours are. I, I don't know. No, but you, you said race was a starting point, so you had a criteria of there is implicit bias against race, but not LGBT, as, as that no. was the whole Can conversation. I, may, I, no? may, I, may I clarify? Yep. Race is a starting point for the uh, implementation of the CRSC pedagogical approach. That, that's a starting point. The implicit bias work, which you know, is separating that every adult Every adult is having implicit. That is not relegated to race. It's just the idea that, as a citizen in this society, we've all received messages on how we see the world, and just to interrogate that and to ensure that whatever those biases might be, and they could be different across individuals, that they not come into play as you work with children. So, just staying with the culturally responsive sustaining education. I, yes, I had to look it up. Um, but one of the principles was high expectations and rigorous instruction. So um, I want us now just talk about that for a second. And I, now Debbie will never vouch for anything I say except for this. I did ask you to give me a random number. Yes, 
I did, I did. So I picked a random, a random school. Uh, in this case, we ended up at uh, IS-68. Um, the DOE's rigorous instruction rating that you gave yourself, presumably, says it's excellent, meaning uh, how well curriculum and instruction are designed to engage in students, foster critical thinking. Uh, you guys rated yourself excellent. Uh, how interesting and challenging is the curriculum? Excellent. How effective is the teaching and learning? Excellent. How well does the, student, the school assess what students are learning? Excellent. That's fine. But then when you go to student achievement, you see that in this particular school, you've also said that 88% of kids are ready for the next level. And yet the only sort of objective test in, in the metrics is performance on state test. Uh, and I, you know, I, don't, I won't surprise you, but this particular school has an 18% passing rate in English, a 16% passing rate in math, both less than half the city average, um, both less than half the borough average, in both cases, I think. How do we marry the two ideas that we have rigorous instruction, that our teachers are extremely effective, that all the kids are ready for the next grade, but then on the objective metrics, the state exam, they, they seem to fail. I mean, 22%, I'm sorry, 82% fail. So, knowing that our department is made up of various offices that have very specific functions, there are offices that deal specifically with how the matrices that we use to evaluate our schools. Um, we are prepared to talk in depth about teacher preparation, so I'm not prepared to respond to that question this time. Um, who, who is responsible for the failure of students? Let me ask it a different way. In this particular school, what will the PD program be like for a school that clearly uh, has trouble having students pass the state exams? What is the PD like? Is it, do you guys uh, dictate from the top down and say, hey, you should focus on different types of pedagogy that will address this? Or are we doing, for example, the implicit bias training, which may have nothing to do with why these students are failing? So essentially, we do not dictate professional learning at the school level. Um, the, the person who is best position to make those decisions would be the school principal, and then the person who next in line would that be the, would be the superintendent who's a supervisor of that principal. So they would be the ones to, to really shape and form the content and the specific. The principal part. only got a good, so that's a step down. The principal may, may not be making the step and the, 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 the perfect decisions because he or she only has a good rating, whereas the teachers are excellent. Um, who, who is responsible for the performance of a school like this? Uh, the mayor uh, spent a lot of his political capital in Albany fighting for extensions of mayor, mayoral control. Uh, is the mayor essentially responsible for some of these test scores? There's no one person responsible for test scores. Um, the mayor wanted accountability. I think most of the stuff he spoke about um, mayoral control rested on how the system needs to have accountability of someone who's elected. I mean, is the mayor then not responsible? I, I, don't, I don't know if this, the binary uh, approach to the questioning is, is going to, I don't know if it's serving students. I mean, I think there's definitely increased accountability um, with this new administration, with the introduction of executive superintendents who supervise superintendents and so forth and so on. So there's definitely accountability. Collectively, okay. collectively, I would say that we're all responsible. Yeah, right. No, I mean, that, that's, I, I think that's a theme is that we should blame society and everyone else. But. Um, so the mayor has had control of the Department of Education essentially for almost six years now. Um, we, we still have a school. Uh, my staff wasn't able to get me the ELA, uh, the, the English and Math test scores from six years ago, but I'm going to go on a, a limb and say maybe they're not any better. Um, if you were here six years ago, your predecessors or someone from the DOE, you would have came with an equally ambitious plan for addressing low test scores in schools. At some point, and again, it can't, be the, it can't be the teachers and it can't be the principal because you told me that they are good and excellent. So if it's not the teachers, it's not the principal, um, wh where does the accountability lie? Does it lie with the chancellor, does it lie with the mayor, or is it just society? I know it's tough, but you said, Mr. Hanna, you said you, you like to have the tough, the tough conversations. 
I didn't. What I said was that the conversations are difficult. This, this, this. One of the things we'd argue is that this is the work, right? The the work of teachers and principals and the entire system coming together to figure out those items that you've that you've laid out. And it it is the work. It's difficult work. It's complicated work. Um, and and we we are trying to take it, and we are taking it on. We are taking it head on, and and, tr and Thank trying you. to improve them. I I just think, uh, and I have no more questions. I just think that when we talk about improving schools, and we say it's really tough to have certain conversations, the conversations that we're not having that are more difficult are that many schools are failing. And I just just for my own curiosity, I looked at the school, the high school where the majority of these students from IS 68 go, uh, and and unsurprisingly. Only 39% of the zoned high school where these kids go are going to produce students that are ready uh, to meet the standards set out by CUNY, uh, meaning they wouldn't need remedial classes. So I think when we talk about the hard conversations that need to happen, I think the hard conversations are on the quality of education that so many of our schools are giving students um, and the, the lack of, of self-awareness of that problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Bavelli. I just have a final question because we've got lots of other people who want to testify. Your project uh, for men, to, men teach. Mm -hmm. You, I believe, in your testimony said you're identifying a thousand people, a thousand young men. Can you give me a status of where they are, how long the program has been in existence, of those who have completed the program, how many have actually gone on to teach? So um, we've been able to meet that initial goal of the 1,000 men of color entering the teaching profession, and they're at different stages. Many of our partners um, within CUNY are supporting participants in that program, and I hope you'll hear more about that today. Um, others are participating in high school to teaching programs community-based organization pathways into teaching, and we've recruited individuals who have come from other school-based roles, like paraprofessionals and school aides. So the trajectory is um, between one to five years is what we're looking at for those individuals to enter the classroom. We can say that of the work we've done to both increase our um, recruitment of men of color who are ready to teach in any given school year, as well as building that longer term pipeline, which is something we're very committed around, that we've seen an increase in the percentage of men of color who we've hired each year go from 8% to 13% over the duration of our efforts. So we see that as a success that we're both identifying um, people to enter the profession and supporting them along the way and seeing that hiring number increase. Directly as a result of the program, can you give me a number of young men who have gone into teaching? Perhaps that first cohort, which now, I th you've been, it's been in existence, I think, for six years? Um, it's three. been three years. Three. Been three years. Yeah. Okay, so perhaps they haven't finished yet, and there are people who are still at the uh, gate trying to come out and we'll get in. Okay, good. I would appreciate the data going forward. And lastly, can you tell me, um, can you disaggregate the data of those new teachers uh, by, by black, Latino, Asian, white? I have a stat which talks about people of color. And if you don't have it now, that's fine. If you could send it to me, I would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. I just want to thank you for coming you. and you've got some questions that we expect you'll get back to us, Absolutely. and we look forward to getting those answers. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we're going to call the second panel. Uh, thank you. We're making some adjustments here, but we are going to call the CUNY panel next.
and we're going to have, um, if they would come forward. And I, I promise that my questions will be focused because there are others who are on a tight schedule that we do want to hear from after you. So please come forward and we're ready for your testimony. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Please state your names for the record. Please turn on your microphone. Ashley Thompson. Michael Middleton. You may begin. Good afternoon. On behalf of this panel from the City University of New York, I would like to thank Chair Traeger and Chair Barron as well as members of the Committees on Education and Higher Education for the opportunity to speak to you on the topic of teacher preparation and training at CUNY. My name is Ashley Thompson and I serve CUNY as University Dean for Education. In this role, I oversee teacher education programs across the university. I am pleased to tell you about our support of students in this important academic and workforce area which contributes to CUNY's role as the leading provider of teachers to the New York City Department of Education. I am joined today by Dr. Michael Middleton, Dean of the School of Education at Hunter College. Hunter was CUNY's first and today is one of our largest schools of education. Our testimony will describe CUNY's efforts to provide New York City with well-prepared, diverse urban educators committed to teaching in our city's public schools. CUNY enrolls more than 18,000 students in education programs across the university, from associate to doctoral degree programs at 16 campuses. More than 7,000 students pursue graduate study, and education is CUNY's largest discipline across master's level programs. CUNY prepares teachers for certification in nearly every subject area licensed in New York State. In the past five years, through concerted effort, CUNY has seen growing undergraduate enrollment in education and a 10% increase in our numbers of graduates. The majority of CUNY's education students are people of color, 63% of teacher candidates and 70% of education students overall. CUNY's education cohorts are growing more diverse each year. From 2010 to 2018, Teacher candidates of color have increased from 61% to 73% of bachelor's students and 37% to 53% of master's students. CUNY has invested targeted resources to recruit and support teacher candidates of color through State Education's Teacher Opportunity Corps and NYC Men Teach. Since 2015, more than 1,000 students have received programmatic and financial supports across now 15 campuses through New York City Men Teach at CUNY, which aims to promote academic momentum and completion, certification and hiring, facilitation of the transfer process, enhanced clinical experience, and seminars on culturally relevant education are hallmarks of the program. New York State and New York City depend upon the diverse teaching force educated by CUNY. In 2016-2017, CUNY comprised 21% of all New York State's graduates of classroom teacher programs, but 36% of the state's graduates of color. In 2017-2018, CUNY prepared 48%, almost half, of all teachers in the state who earned a license in bilingual education. This was up from 41% the previous year. As in the example of bilingual education, which content areas our pre-service and in-service teachers are able to pursue grows and deepens each year to support the needs of our city's schools. CUNY has launched new programs in physical education and health education, proactively addressing needs described by reports from the Office of the Controller. New residencies focused on computational thinking aligned with computer science for all, and new online advanced certificates in high need areas like special education TESOL and bilingual education. As New York State Education Department will soon increase the number of student teaching hours required, CUNY explores ways to expand financial aid available to support undergraduate and graduate candidates. We have developed initiatives to prepare students for state certification exams, including those which focus on teaching students with disabilities and English language learners. 
A strong local P20 partnership undergirds these connections between CUNY and our schools of education and the New York City Department of Education and its districts and schools. CUNY and DOE engage in deep, deep teacher pipeline work, especially as it connects to teacher diversity, recruitment and hiring, to better address teacher supply and demand. Leadership teams focus on innovative approaches to increasing pre-service clinical preparation, joint funding opportunities, new programs to meet hiring needs, state certification, and communication. We share data with the aim of better supporting teachers in both pre-service and in-service roles. Collaboration centers on a commitment to continue to improve outcomes for students. CUNY provides many pathways into a professional teaching career for thousands of candidates from a wide range of backgrounds and starting points, more affordably and with less debt than other New York State institutions. From welcoming new cohorts of teaching fellows, adult learners excited to change careers and enter the classroom, to celebrating CUNY graduates honored as Big Apple Award winners, to supporting faculty with ideas for curricular innovation, CUNY is committed to teachers' clinical readiness, lifelong development, and career success. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to Chair Traeger and Chair Barron, as well as members of the Committees on Education and Higher Education for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. My name is Michael Middleton, and I serve as the Clara and Larry Silverstein Dean of the School of Education at Hunter College of the City University of New York. Since our founding in 1870, Hunter College has been dedicated to educating deeply thoughtful, knowledgeable, and highly effective teachers, administrators, and counselors, future professionals who on a daily basis make a significant and positive impact on their students and on the city of New York. We've been the recipient of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities Krista McAuliffe Excellence in Teacher Education Award, which honors exemplary teacher education programs. All our programs in teacher preparation are currently accredited by the Council for Accreditation of Educator Preparation. In the fall 2018, we enrolled 2,787 students in teacher preparation programs, 78% of whom identify as female and 54% as non-white. We graduated approximately 1,200 students in teacher preparation programs this year with over 1,000 recommended for state certification. Recent numbers obtained from CUNY show that 62% of completers of graduate education programs from Hunter and 47% of completers of undergraduate programs were employed by the New York City Department of Education. We are committed to preparing professionals to meet shortage areas, uh, shortage area needs for the city. In 2018, 19% of our graduates were from bilingual education or TESOL programs, 7% from adolescent math or science, and 32% across special education programs, including work with the blind, deaf, and hard of hearing students, those students with severe or multiple disabilities, and students with learning and behavioral challenges. 49% of our graduates who applied to the Department of Education were hired, and more than half of those, 54%, were hired in shortage areas of math, science, Spanish, ESL, or special education. Over the last five years, I'm proud to report that more than 50% of the degrees awarded by the School of Education have been in these teacher shortage areas. Hunter is committed to educating reflective, knowledgeable, and highly effective candidates as future professionals who will make a significant impact on the academic achievement as well as the intellectual, social, and emotional development of their students. Today I'd like to highlight two elements of our program, our clinical practice work and our commitment to educating a diverse student population. Our clinical experiences in all programs are intentionally structured so that teacher candidates have initial field experiences focused on observing teachers and students in diverse classrooms, more extensive intermediate experiences where they begin to work with small groups of learners, including students with disabilities and those for whom English is a new language, and culminating student teaching experiences of 14 weeks, which exceeds the current rec requirements by the New York State Education Department. During student teaching, our assessment criteria align closely with those utilized by the New York City Department of Education for evaluation of classroom teachers. The combination of coursework at Hunter, purposeful clinical experiences at three levels, and focused support from our faculty and mentor teachers help ensure that teacher candidates who graduate from Hunter College 
are well prepared as classroom teachers to serve the New York City public schools. At Hunter, we are deeply committed to educating professionals who are prepared to meet the opportunities of teaching our students our school's diverse population and approach this commitment in several ways. All teacher education students are required to take courses in special education and the social foundations of education, which cover multicultural education and teaching in ways that are responsive to the diversity in our teacher candidates' future classrooms. Our students also take coursework in child development that covers not only children's cognitive and physical growth, but also their social and emotional learning, first and, language, second, uh, first and second language acquisition, and other topics especially relevant to the diversity in our city. Finally, to support the linguistic diversity present across New York schools, the Hunter uh, School of Education offers bilingual programs in Spanish, Chinese, and French for early childhood and childhood education teachers, counselors, and school personnel who want to be prepared and certified to work with their dual language students. This curriculum serves as the basis for our many partnership programs with districts and organizations, and specifically in our work with the New York City Department of Education, since effectively serving students by supporting their diversity across race, language, disability, and other categories is our shared goal and mission. We have worked with the Teaching Fellows Program for over a decade, supporting over 2,000 students as they became teachers and grew as professionals in special education, TESOL, and bilingual education. We work to prepare more early childhood educators to respond to the mayor's universal pre-K initiative, and we work with current teachers to enhance their math knowledge to more effectively teach students in the Algebra for All initiative, a critical entryway to achieving college readiness. Hunter also engages outside experts for short-term work with our faculty and students to advance our understanding of how to teach in ways that support all New York City students. Over the past two years alone, Dr. Django Paris, a national expert in multicultural education, Dr. Mariana Soto Manning, whose research examines how to address inequities through early childhood education, and Dr. Sonia Nieto, who has expertise in the education of students of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, have come to Hunter to hold workshops and lectures that supplement our coursework and provide distinct learning opportunities for our students, faculty, and current school teachers. In addition to supporting the children in the New York City public schools through producing high quality professionals, we also recognize and believe in the importance of recruiting and supporting teachers who reflect the diversity of our city. Hunter has a campus chapter of the Mayor's New York City Men Teach Initiative, whose specific mission is to recruit and unite black, Latino, and Asian men committed to educating the city's diverse population. We've also been awarded a second round of funding from the New York State Education Department for a Hunter Teacher Opportunity Corps to increase the participation of historically underrepresented individuals in teaching careers and to prepare teachers to address the learning needs of all students. As a result of our efforts, 54% of, of students in our teacher preparation programs identify as non-white, whereas the national average is approximately 20%. I'd like to conclude my comments with two brief examples that illustrate our work. In learning methods for teaching literacy, our childhood education students go into their students' neighborhoods to identify literacy examples in the local community. Our teacher candidates then reflect on what they've learned about the literacy resources across different communities and how that knowledge helps teachers support literacy development. And finally, I'd like to share the story of a Hunter graduate whose family immigrated from Afghanistan. He was a New York City public school student who attended Hunter College. He dreamed of being a teacher because he felt he could understand the struggles of many of the city's students. He was recruited to and applied to our master's program, receiving support from the New York City Men Teach Initiative. With our support, he successfully completed his degree and is now a second grade teacher in an elementary school in the Bronx. And last week, he brought his young students to visit Hunter College because he wants to give them the dream of higher education and to show them how their work in his classroom is an important step on that journey. Hunter has been preparing teachers for this great city since 1870. As we enter the second half of our second century in operation, I'm proud I can speak for our faculty and staff and say to the council that we are more committed than ever to ensuring that New York City's children all have a well-prepared, effective educator to guide their development. High quality public education from pre-K through graduate school has been and will continue to be the engine driving the incomparable success and unending dynamism of the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I have some very focused questions and if you could 
uh, be concise in your answers. I would appreciate that because we want to make sure we hear from all of the panels. Now, we know that CUNY has a multi-tiered system in terms of the requirements for entrance to some of the senior colleges and a higher requirement for SAT than some of the other colleges in CUNY. We know that there are a greater concentration of black students in the community colleges than in the senior colleges. What is being done to help facilitate students who are in community colleges where they can't complete all the requirements to be able to become a certified teacher? What is being done to create a, a, a stream where they can transfer directly to that? We know that at community colleges, their, their completion rate is much lower than at senior colleges. So we have a greater concentration of blacks at community colleges. What are we doing to encourage students at community colleges to come to the senior colleges and complete that? Do you have any data as to the number of students that are transferring particularly to the teacher education programs, teacher prep programs? I can give you a few examples and some data. So the first thing I'll say is that uh, students who begin in a community college are actually overrepresented in education than in other majors. So um, I will double check these data for you, Chair Barron, but um, in, the, in the typical um, uh, CUNY majors, I think the community college students comprise about 45% of the graduates, and in teacher education, it's about 55%. So it's a, it's a higher percentage. Um, it's one of the reasons why it was important to expand NYC Men Teach and make sure that it was robust at the community colleges so students received the supports there and then got um, specific advisement to connect them with the senior colleges. So the 15 colleges represent um, both community colleges and senior colleges and there's um, a close framework to help transfer. Articulation agreements are another mechanism that are strong in education and they're uh, always growing. We're always developing new ones so that the coursework that students take in the community colleges right. um, connects well yes. to the senior colleges and mm -hmm. dual degree programs are another mechanism we use. And we have some good examples of success. Is the uh, Men Teach initiative at all of the community colleges? All of the community colleges except for Gutman. And in terms of the um, questions that I addressed to DOE, is there a program that you are aware of where persons who have not completed a teacher prep, teacher education program at a university or college, but who will be placed in a classroom in September, is there a program that you engage with with the DOE that provides them with some training about what to expect when they step in the classroom? And if so, can you describe how that program operates? All of the programs that, that we would offer at CUNY are credit-based to you know, get teachers certified to go into the right. classroom. Right, but DOE said that they reach out and have some training, some pre-service training for those who are going to be in the classroom who have not gone through a, a teacher education program. Do you know of any programs that CUNY provides to DOE, which is, you know, we're a partner in the teaching. microwave version of how to be a teacher? Right, right. Um, so we do have teaching fellows at CUNY, um, but they, those students are enrolling in summer coursework. They're getting certified before they enter the classroom in the fall. So you have teaching fellows at CUNY. Mm -hmm. And how do, can you describe that program for me? Sure. So we have currently four colleges at CUNY who enroll teaching fellows and they're in various high need areas. Um, this summer we welcomed uh, about 440 students in this new cohort. Um, since the program began, I think we've had about 12,000 students enrolling in teaching fellows. We have a long history with the DOE. Um, and the programs differ campus by campus and by content area depending on what the requirements are. So these are persons who are already teaching 
and who are now going for certification so that they can become permanent teachers. Is that correct? No, the Teaching Fellows Program would, um, and all the recruitment and screening um, first is done by the DOE and uh, then CUNY. These are individuals who have a baccalaureate degree. They're applying to the program and then they enroll in CUNY for summer coursework. Is all of the coursework done over summers? Or the initial, they? but they complete a master's degree as part of the program. So they're not yet teachers? They're not yet teachers. And how many, how extensive is the summer coursework? It would vary. I don't know, Michael, if you have examples of what the teaching fellows do at Hunter. In our program, we've tried to align the summer curriculum in anticipation of the classrooms they'll be in in the fall. Um, and so, for example, in our special ed classroom, we've moved our methods, courses, and special ed to the summer so that when they enter classrooms um, in the fall, they're more prepared with the challenges of uh, facing the diversity of students in those classrooms. How many classes or credits or how many hours do teaching fellows um, have to take during the summer? I can check for you and get okay. back to you on that. Okay. All right, I'd appreciate that. Now, uh, the TEACH grant program from the feds uh, are grants to eligible IHEs, institutions of higher learning, higher education, and it gives a grant of up to $4,000 annually to eligible teacher preparation candidates. How, how extensive is that program with CUNY? And I understand that there's some new requirements and some new evaluations that are gonna be coming forth. And do you have any idea of um, how you're going to operate with that? It says the first year for which programs might lose teach grant eligibility is 21-22, 2021 through 2022. So what is your status at this point uh, with those teach grants? Yes, thank you. So uh, CUNY's in the process of actually expanding the number of students who will be able to access TEACH grants. This is something we're um, beginning for fall 2019, that it would be open to undergraduate students. Previous to this, graduate students have been eligible for TEACH grants, but we think more students could benefit, so we'll um, expand the pool of eligible students. Um, so TEACH grants are for undergrad as well as grad? Yes according to the federal definition. So in 20, in academic year 2016-2017, I think we had about 55 students who were able to access TEACH grants of various amounts. It's, they have to complete the FAFSA, it's part of their financial aid mm -hmm. um, process. And um, for this year, we're, we still have students who are being packaged because it uh, rolls until September. I can get you those numbers, but it's been relatively small. It's restricted by um, the content areas. It's only for high need fields. Oh. And um, students, once they graduate, have to get certified and hired, and then they have to stay um, as a teacher. If they don't do the things that the federal government asks, it reverts to loans. So I think they're uh, one opportunity we have for fall is to not only really work closely with students to make sure that they do everything they need to do to access the grants, um, but make sure that students who might be loan averse um, can really take advantage of the resources for them. Is the grant eligible for subsequent years or is it a one-time grant? I can check that and get back to you, but I think they can access it for more than one year. I will check. Okay. Chair, yes. I can also, uh, back to your teaching fellows question, uh, the teaching fellows at Hunter College take between nine and 12 credit hours in their first summer in the program. With regard to the TEACH grant at Hunter College, we've had 38 recipients of TEACH grants since, uh, th since the program has begun. Um, it's open to graduate students who commit to teaching in a high need subject area, as Dean Thompson has said, and are committed to four years of post-graduation work in high need uh, schools. Um, they also have to maintain a 3.25 uh, GPA. What's the GPA? 3.25 okay. and are within the 75th percentile on their GREs. So in the past three semesters at Hunter, we've had in spring 2018, 13 students, in fall 2018, 12 awardees, and in spring 2019, 13 awardees. 
Most of those have uh, been from our adolescent special education program. Okay. Um, I have other questions, but I, I do want to respect the uh, audience and the other panels that are coming up, so we will prepare them and send them to you, and we look forward to a response, as we always do get from CUNY. And of course, for the record, I am a graduate of Hunter, and uh, it was because of the, the psychology classes that I took at Hunter that I was able to be accepted in lieu of having had, not having had um, education courses, but it did me very well, and I'm a proud alum and grateful for the opportunity to, to have been at Hunter and was only able to go because at that time, CUNY was tuition free. If you graduated with a B or better average, you went tuition free. You had to pay for books and other costs that we know, but that's what I'm working towards, bringing CUNY back tuition free. And it seems to be in the atmosphere, there are other folks who are talking about getting to that state as well. So look for your cooperation in that regard as well. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're calling our next panel. We're going to have Assemblywoman Joanne Simon, a New York Assembly member. We thank you for your patience. David Saltstall, the New York Comptroller's Office, and Christine Collins, the Director of Teacher Centers at UFT. Thank you so much. Uh, you can begin in whatever order you'd like to start. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the Assemblywoman because you've been waiting and I know you have some time to go. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, Chair Barron and uh, members of the committee who are not here. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for this opportunity to address this important topic, the training of our teachers in whose care we entrust our children, in other words, the future of this country and of the world. I'm Assemblymember Joanne Simon, representing the 52nd Assembly District, comprising the neighborhoods of Borham Hill, Brooklyn Heights, Cobble Hill, Carroll Gardens, Dumbo, Fulton Ferry Landing, Gowanus, Vinegar Hill, most of Park Slope and parts of Prospect Heights. I'm also a former teacher of the deaf and a former president of the New York branch of the International Dyslexia Association, uh, uh, now known as Everyone Reading, and a founding member of the Arise Coalition, who I believe you'll be hearing from later today. As a disability civil rights attorney, I have also represented families in special education matters in the past, although I don't currently practice in that area. I'd like to share with you some of my experiences and efforts to help improve teacher training in New York. Unfortunately, some of what I am about to say, I've been saying for the past 30 years. We simply must do a better job of providing our pre-service teachers, our current teachers, and uh, uh, ongoing at the elbow supports to our New York City public school teachers so that they're prepared to provide all students, including those with dyslexia and other disabilities, with appropriate evidence-based effective literacy instruction that is grounded in the science of reading. There are evidence-based programs on the market, but many of them do not work and are not effective. As an educator, it's been my experience that American teacher preparation programs fail in two main areas, the teaching of reading and behavior management. I'll confine my remarks to the teaching of reading and the early identification of reading problems. And I want to say that I'm not panning every teacher preparation program. We have some very fine programs in this state, but we don't have enough consistency or enough um, uh, breadth of, of uh, uh, teacher preparation programs that adequately address issues of reading. So a, a lot happens in the brain when we learn to read. It becomes complicated and daunting task when letters and numbers become mixed up because the neural systems involved are wired differently from non-disabled readers. Approximately 15% of children have dyslexia, a brain-based learning disability that makes word recognition, spelling, and reading success a very difficult task. About 85% of children with learning disabilities have dyslexia, making it the most prevalent learning disability in children. 
yet most parents, teachers, and administrators um, do not know how to recognize its symptoms. How many of our pre-K to 12 teachers know that a child who does not like Dr. Seuss books is at risk for dyslexia, for example? Children naturally love rhyming. Children with dyslexia don't get it. Ask any dyslexic, they'll tell you. I believe our top educational priority should be teaching our kids to read. And that will not happen unless we teach our teachers how to teach reading. Too often, teacher preparation programs teach students about reading, but not actually how to do it. They do not teach their students about structured, multisensory, language-based instruction in reading. Our teachers simply must be familiar with effective approaches for helping struggling students learn to read, write, and spell. And uh, while my experience is primarily with dyslexia, a structured, multisensory, language-based approach will certainly help all students, uh, and particularly ELL students. So the schools should look to the National Reading Panel's findings, which were issued in the year 2000, and which identified the five pillars of reading, phonemic awareness, phonics, morphemic awareness, vocabulary, and comprehension. Few teachers could identify these terms. Research has consistently shown that only 25% of America's teachers can tell a morpheme from a synonym. There's no reason to believe New York's teachers are any different. How can they teach reading if they don't know this information? or know that there are 44 phonemes in the English language, or what a phoneme is. Yet phonemic awareness and morphemic awareness are among the basic building blocks of reading for all children. Explicit and systematic instruction in these skills has repeatedly been found to be beneficial for all students, and absolutely is essential for those with dyslexia. The consequences of an inadequate ability to read have a huge impact on our society. Fueling the school to prison pipeline is only one such impact. Children need the basic ability to read and write to become successful members of society. I started with, I found a typo. Okay, so if we want to hold our schools and our teachers accountable for the education of our students, we must give teachers the knowledge and tools they need to teach reading. We need this yesterday. It's not the student's fault that they can't read, and it's not the teachers either if we haven't, they haven't themselves been taught. Too many teacher education programs teach students outdated methods or no methods of, at all. Whole language, for example, was never intended to help kids who need explicit instruction in reading, and not surprisingly, it has not worked for them. Roughly 40% of our kids are reading poorly. They're simply following the National Reading Panel's recommendations would help all children. We can make a difference, and I bring to your attention two bills that I carry in the State Assembly. Uh, A5259A, which requires the schools in New York State to implement a program of early screening for kids at risk for reading failure. It requires a simple, evidence-based, effective method of identifying children at risk be implemented by teachers themselves. Very brief, very little training is required, but the byproduct of teachers doing this is that they will become aware of what are the kinds of questions, what are the kinds of answers that uh, children will give them, and they'd be able to better identify just by having engaged in that practice. Another bill I carry, which is A6450, would require that every institution of higher education that offers a graduate or undergraduate degree or certification program in education or educational administration located within the state to incorporate evidence-based effective methods of teaching reading which shall include instruction in direct and explicit structured multisensory approaches, also known as structured literacy, not balanced literacy, structured literacy, within the current required literacy curriculum. Finally, I believe that as you go about your important work, we must recognize that not every reading program sold as being research-based is research-validated or effective. When it comes to purchasing decisions, we need to be doing our research and at least check the What Works Clearinghouse, which is in, on the, the um, Federal Education Department's uh, website. Programs in use in our schools today, some of them lack any evidence-based effectiveness, such as foundations, balanced literacy, and Teach for America. And of course, many programs that desperate parents seek out on their own, like Hooked on Phonics. The list of programs with little or mixed effectiveness and those with no effectiveness is twice as long as those with possible or potential effectiveness, but they all advertise that they are evidence-based. Uh, so I suggest that we stop wasting the public's money and our children's precious few years to acquire reading skills and have the adults do their homework first. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.
Thank you. Thank you, next panelist. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christina Collins. I'm Director of Research and Policy for the UFT Teacher Center, and I'm here on behalf of Vice President of Education and Executive Director of the Teacher Center, Evelyn De Jesus. On behalf of Vice President De Jesus and our 190,000 members, we just want to thank the City Council, um, particularly Chair Barron and Chair Traeger, for holding this meeting uh, today. Um, and we'd also like to recognize City Council Speaker Johnson and the rest of the council uh, for your strong leadership and particularly for passing the most recent City Council budget. Um, I'd like to speak first today about the matter of teacher preparation um, and how we believe we can improve our current system. Uh, one of the things that you may know is that New York City, like many urban districts, has a very difficult time retaining its newest teachers. And when we speak with new teachers, one of the things we hear constantly, especially from those who are struggling in their first year, um, is that I didn't learn this in education school. And what we believe is that we need a new paradigm um, for training of new teachers, um, one that mirrors the medical profession and gives our prospective teachers a student residency of working, teaching, and learning inside a New York City school. Um, and so because of this, uh, we've been in talk with the DOE, um, as well as with the City University of New York, about how such a residency program could be structured. Um, each year, New York City has been hiring above 4,000 new teachers, and we do support a residency program that would absorb as many of these new hires as possible. Um, New York City Controller Stringer just re yesterday proposed a residency program that would build on the existing alternative preparation program, the New York City Teaching Fellows. Um, and we believe that with so many public school advocates now calling for a vigorous residency program, we hope that it's an idea that's, whose time has come. Um, next, I'd like to turn to the work of the UFT Teacher Center. Um, which uh, we very much, again, value the City Council's recent commitment to ensuring that our teachers are adequately prepared to succeed, but also that they receive meaningful learning opportunities throughout their careers um, that help them grow into and remain exceptional educators for our students. Um, and so we would particularly like to thank the City Council for their support um, in their recent investment in the UFT uh, teacher Center in the most recent City Council budget. Um, the UFT Teacher Center uh, is an award-winning program that's been around since 1979. Um, we're a school-based professional development program um, that's a collaboration of the UFT, um, the State Ed Department, the DOE, as well as individual schools and districts, as well as other cultural uh, institutions. We currently at the Teacher Center operate across all five boroughs of New York City, um, and we have dedicated school-embedded professional learning specialists in over 115 schools that are there full-time working with those staffs on professional learning. Um, and we also have 25 very experienced New York City educators who serve as our Teacher Center field staff and field liaison working with those schools as well as coordinating citywide professional learning opportunities. And we draw from current research and best practices um, to create with those teachers and those professional learning specialists activities that are designed and taught by educators for educators across New York City. Um, they're designed to deepen content knowledge across all subject areas, including shortage area subjects such as math and science, which I'll speak to uh, a little bit later. They're designed to enhance all teachers' pedagogical skills, and they're designed to support teachers to better serve all students, including multi-language learners and students with special needs. So our activities that um, we create and carry out throughout the district include intensive in-classroom support, um, after-school study groups, citywide networks, conferences, and seminars, and we have deep experience in the design um, and offering of high-quality professional learning in collaboration with, as I mentioned, both the DOE and with outside partners. Um, we have a long history of bringing innovative new content uh, into district schools, 
and pedagogical practices directly to classroom teachers in schools across the city and working then side by side with them throughout the school year to support engaging instruction for their students. Um, as I mentioned, we have a network of 115 school-based sites as well as our conferences. And during the 2017-18 school year, we provided professional learning to over 246,000 participants in our activities. Um, these included teachers, administrators, paraprofessionals, school staff, and parents across the city. Um, we believe that now more than ever, the Teacher Center is uniquely positioned to play a leading role as New York State moves to create and implement its new next generation learning standards and related resources and curricula. Um, the teacher centers have and will continue to play a vital part in developing uh, New York's professional development plan requirements um, and helping educate classroom teachers across the city um, so that their work in the classroom aligns with new standards. I'll mention that we also support national board certification. We serve as an approved state partner for providing continuing teacher and learn leader education, CTLE credits to teachers. We have partnerships with six local colleges and universities and with NYSIT, the New York State United Teachers College partners, including Brooklyn College and the New York Institute of Technology to offer teachers uh, additional professional learning opportunities through them as well. So then I'll just, uh, and by offering a few specific examples of great projects that our teacher center site staff have worked on. Um, one focuses on students with special needs. Um, our teacher center school-based site inside PS396, which is a special education program located inside PS532 in Crown Heights, it recently opened, it just opened in April of this year, 2019. And already the site has been working with educators from four other District 75 locations and affects more than 1,600 special needs students in kindergarten through eighth grade. Our colleague, our site person there, Shamika Hill, um, is, uh, has already been planning multiple presentations about how the new state learning standards in ELA and math can be used to apply to special needs students. Um, as she describes herself, I am a resource to these students and their teachers. And by May 19, uh, 2019, uh, the teachers at those locations were already, remember this had, site had just opened in April, um, reporting that the teacher center site was providing them with hands-on materials for their students and were thrilled to have this content because they were already using it to write curriculum for their special needs students. Um, next, I'll move on to our civic education work. We, would, um, we are currently supported by a small pilot grant from the AFT, the National Union, to meet with educators from K-12 to classrooms across the city to meet with them to discuss their vision for civics education in New York City schools. And we're planning to write recommendations to present to the New York State Board of Regents in the fall to inform their civic education work. Um, that recommenda those recommendations will inform the state's uh, K-12 framework for civic participation. Um, which we believe goes beyond just educating high school students in democratic responsibilities such as jury duty and voting, but also support students of all ages in how they should behave and interact with each other and with their communities. Um, for example, working with sixth graders to uh, practice how to show respect in classroom debates regardless of your opinion on someone else's viewpoint. Um, finally, as educators, we're no, we know we're preparing students for a world we can barely dream of around issues of science, technology, and math. Um, and so our teacher center folks have the ability to work with teachers so that students have fun exploring these skills as well. So at educators at PS28 in the Bronx just worked with their teacher center coach uh, to design and build structures that could prevent an ice cube or at least slow an ice cube from melting in the sun. Um, and so teams of teachers uh, evaluated their design, improved their design, built the design, and then worked with their teacher center coach to see that experiment through the eyes of both a teacher and a student. And then we'll go back and work with their kindergarten students to recreate the experience of building those structures. Um, as well as learning state-based scientific standards and vocabulary about the effects of sunlight on the Earth's surface. 
So in closing, I'd just like to say that we understand that providing all of our students with a world-class education uh, means that our educators must be well prepared and afforded consistent professional development. Um, we're committed to providing our members with substantive and meaningful learning opportunities throughout their careers um, and strongly believe that now is the time to engage in a conversation about both implementing residency programs um, and to continuing to support our signature professional learning opportunities through the UFT Teacher Center to guarantee that our New York City students are served by the best educators that they can be. So I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you. Next panelist. Thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, giving us this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is David Saltonstall, and I'm the as Assistant Controller for Policy for New York City Controller Scott Stringer. Um, yesterday, Controller Stringer uh, issued a report, I believe the Sergeant at Arms has uh, shared it with you, uh, examining an issue at the, at the core of today's hearing, which is the persistent problem of high teacher turnover rates. The Controller's report provides a new analysis of the scale and the scope of teacher turnover in our city and shows the disproportionate impact of high turnover across school districts. Ultimately, the report reveals that a staggering 41% of all teachers hired in the 2012-13 school year left their posts within five years. That's more than 1,800 teachers gone since the day they signed up five years ago. In many districts, teacher churn is even higher, like in School District 12 in the Bronx, which lost 31% of its teachers last year alone. The problem, as we outline in our report, in our opinion, is that the DOE is not doing enough to prepare new teachers who enter the classroom through alternative pathways. Indeed, today's teacher fellows often get just a few weeks of in-class training before they are handed the keys to their own classroom. So, Comptroller Stringer is calling on DOE to establish a large-scale paid residency program to expand in-classroom experience, providing teacher candidates an affordable pathway to high-quality preparation. A residency program gives new, new teachers a full year to work alongside a master teacher and gain the experience needed to manage their own classes. Not everything can be learned in a textbook, and that includes teaching. Giving new teachers a full year to understand the social and educational challenges that every teacher faces will improve their chances of staying in the system over the long haul. We know this because similar paid residencies, like those we are proposing, are already succeeding in Boston, in Denver, and even here in New York City, where new visions for public schools, teachers' college, and the Museum of Natural History have run small but very successful residency programs <coughs> for years. It's important to remember that teacher turnover isn't just an HR challenge. It's, it's an educational disaster for students. A revolving door of inexperienced teachers is particularly damaging for the city's <coughs> most vulnerable students. In New York City, schools with high concentrations of poverty often experience both higher percentages of new teachers as well as higher rate, rates of turnover, compounding other deep inequities in the system. When fully scaled, we believe a teacher residency program could place a thousand resident teachers in city schools each year, significantly improving the quality and stability of the teaching pipeline. We believe, the system, we believe this would cost the system an additional $40 million over and above the $22 million we are spending on today's Teaching Fellows program. But we also anticipate that over time, the city would regain some of the initial investment through cost savings from improved retention. Providing teacher candidates an affordable pathway to high quality preparation is key to improving teacher retention, as well as diversifying the ranks of the teacher workforce. By minimizing financial obstacles and giving new teachers the training and support they deserve, we can lift up not just our schools, but our kids as well, and we are grateful for the UFT's support in, in, in this residency model. So that's, um, that's all we have for today. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I am, of course, um, eager to answer any questions you might have. 
Uh, thank you. Just very briefly, uh, the controller's proposal is for what candidates, at what level, and at what point for them to be in residency? I mean, it would essentially build off the current teacher fellows program, um, but instead of managing their own classroom in that first year, they would be shadowing a, a master teacher for a full year. And, and then, when that year is over, they would be essentially first in line to be, to be hired as, as okay. teachers. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a teacher center in my school, so I know the value of that. And to uh, Dr. <coughs> Simon, we thank you. That's when I was able to understand how to teach reading when I attended Bank Street and so much of the teaching um, philosophy, techniques, and as you talk about multi-sensory, that's so important to be able to get children to understand what reading is and, and that it's an interaction and find the way that each child learns. So I wanna thank the panel very much for coming, for your patience and for your presentation. Thank you. And we'll call our next panel uh, Sergeant at Arms may need to get us more chairs because it's going to be a large panel. We're going to have Alan Singer from Hofstra University. We're going to have Amy Katembo from Teachers College, Columbia University. Karen DeMoss from Bank Street. Frank Pignatosi from NYU. Jennifer Pankowski from Pace University. Jacob Eastley from Toro College, and Dr. Trina Lynn Yearwood from Long Island University. So these are the folks who are going to tell us what it is that their institutions are actually doing so that we can see uh, how we can interact with them and what we can do to make it more effective in terms of preparing our teachers and share the great information that they have. So I will start on my right, and we'll go th straight through. And again, thank you for your patience. Push the button, the red light is will come on? on. Now it is. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Traeger and Chair Varon, uh, and all the uh, council members. Uh, my name is uh, Frank Pinatosi. I'm a um, clinical assistant professor at um, NYU's uh, School of Cultural Education and Human Development, um, and I'm happy to testify on how we address teacher prep and teacher training. Um, to go straight to the point, I think our challenge is to rethink the model. Um, I often see the, the relationship that the DOE and other school districts and teacher prep programs have had as partners is shuffling candidates to one another from pre-service status to in-service status, uh, much as divorced parents do with their children uh, where they uh, collaborate but never in the same place, right? So they're, they're, the input is always in, in separate venues. Uh, and the onus of the partnership too often falls on the single candidate to negotiate the input they're getting from one agency or from the other agency. Um, so one of the things that NYU has done is to rethink the model and in the larger world of residency, rather than just delegating the candidates to uh, school spaces, is really to co-share and to co-inhabit those school spaces. So where we've created a residency model where our faculty work um, every week in schools with the school administrators, the school teachers, and we co-coach. Uh, we work with the students directly, we work with the interns, we also work with the teachers, and we learn also from the uh, curriculum uh, leads and the assistant principals in the school so that we can create a feedback loop that is, is continuous. Uh, I myself am, am one of the residency directors that works uh, with some of the schools here in the city, in the Bronx, and Brownsville, and Bush and Canarsie, and we've been working also with districts around the country. Uh, and it is a residency model that is based on hiring, employing the intern for that full year um, while they're taking, and co-sharing the cost through scholarships and, and contribution to the master's program. Um, the, the other piece is also very much what's important about this program and our general approach is really moving away from quantity and much more towards quality. Um, for example, our belief around teaching students with disabilities is not only about certifying more teachers 
that are ready to teach students with disabilities, but it's about really how do we prepare teachers who are not certified in special ed to work across the board? And how do we get them to understand the racial disproportionality that exists already in the referral process? And how to work towards um, focusing on those students who need to be referred and helping students outside of the referral process to, um, to, to, to benefit and, and, and to improve their, uh, their outcomes. And similarly, when it comes to emergent bilinguals, uh, I, th I think it's important that we, uh, it's about really understanding communities and starting from communities and not only from the coursework. Um, in our program, students are required to work with communities, with com community uh, members and create projects that bring them into the communities at a time when more and more of our teachers rarely work in the community, rarely live in the communities where, where the school, their schools are located. So how does that begin and how uh, therefore, does the multilingual presence in the community begin to impact and shape the way they're thinking about their students and about uh, interacting? Um, and we've, we've started working where our special ed majors and our non-special ed majors actually collaborate on the planning during their internship year, rather than having one only delegate to the other when it comes time to, uh, to differentiate. Um, and I, I, I I think it's important that rather than wasting the expertise we both agencies have uh, and only working in, in, in uh, creating partnerships in rooms and co-crafting curriculum, that we actually share the space within schools uh, and begin to co-collaborate uh, rather than, um, again, handing off one, one to the other. Um, finally, I, I think it's, it's, it's important that if, we, you know, we've made great efforts to not only uh, assign our students to work in schools in, in different communities, uh, but clearly also to change the, the approach of who are the candidates we're, we're bringing into the field. Um, already this was a transition that was occurring on, on the campus programs, but even more in this residency program, where on the national level we have 60% of candidates who identify as of color, and then in New York City it's well over 90% who identify uh, of color, um, with the smaller minority still being men of color, right? Uh, though that is a, a growing number. Uh, but I also want to really, uh, the importance that we, and I was also on the state um, clinical practice group that looked at revising the student teacher requirements, and one of my uh, challenges is that we focus again more on quality and quantity, and it's a little difficult to lament the inequity of our school system, uh, and then to base our admissions process on the grades that come uh, out of that school system. It's, it's a little difficult to lament uh, the struggle to attract teachers from diverse backgrounds and then to increase the requirements um, like student teaching hours without looking at the quality, which really makes it difficult for someone to generate income so that they can stay within a full-time program. Um, I will stop there and um, honor the presence of my colleagues. I thank you very much for the time and I'm very uh, happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. I think I'll perhaps ask questions after each of you finish. Did you mention that you're working in Brownsville? We are uh, in New York City. We're working uh, largely with charter networks that are, in, and so we're working in the Bronx, Brownsville. Um, Do you know the school in Brownsville? Uh, we, in the, this year, we were, we're working with Brooklyn Ascent. Okay, great. Thank you. Next panelist. So good afternoon um, to our chairs Traeger and Barron, and to the council members for providing this opportunity for us to address the issues in educator preparation in particular. So. I am Jacob Easley. I am Dean for the Graduate School of Education, Toro College, um, and I am providing testimo testimony today regarding educated preparation in higher education specifically, particularly related to diversity of teacher, the teacher workforce and meeting the challenges of New York City's hard to fill licensure areas and classrooms. Um, and in doing so, Toro stands alone as a standalone institution is on record for one of the um, largest providers of special educator teachers special education teachers prepared and hired by NYC DOE along with other high needs areas. And we're also number one, number nine in the nation according to diverse issues in higher education for graduating minority teachers in education at the graduate level. And a recent report by Education Trust reveals that our graduates who are in DOE um, have a student achievement growth rate that is above the overall average of New York City teachers. And as our colleagues from DOE mentioned earlier, we're also one of those new um, partners around US PrEP, um, which is a collaborative effort to redesign the clinical practice, looking both at curriculum um, on both sides of the aisle and how we coordinate our um, supports of new teachers. 
So, um, um, Chairperson um, Barron, like you, I also was not a traditional, pr traditionally prepared, and I was a teacher. Um, and as dean, I um, now oversee operations of over 2,400 students annually and about 20,000 alumni. And um, of course, as you know, we work tirelessly to ensure that our um, candidates are highly prepared. So part of that includes partnering with DOE. And as um, I share these perspectives, I hope that um, they are food for thought for all of us here, it, my colleagues in the room, as well as those um, on the panel, I mean, those on the um, commission. So I wanna talk about educator preparation. So I think it is an unfounded belief that all EPPs, at least in the higher education um, level, are of poor quality or lack accountability. So as you know, all of our programs have to be approved by the state. In addition to that, we're currently, by state legislation, are required to undergo national accreditation, which is currently on a seven-year cycle. And I mentioned earlier about an annual reporting to the federal government that's under um, um, Title II. So there are efforts and, and, and systems in place to ensure that we are accountable. But I do believe that in the event that there are individual institutions that do not meet state or national expectations for effectiveness, they must be identified, supported, and are sanctioned by following state policy. So that's the first thing that I would like to talk about. In the area of teacher diversity in high needs area, there are numerous advantages, as we know from the research, on having a culturally, linguistically, and racially diverse teaching force. And we're seeing that that benefit is not only on student learning, but also on the overall um, school culture and climate. And like many of my peers who are here today, Toro College has established a, a strategic plan to identify, recruit, and develop talented, minority, and linguistically diverse teachers for New York City schools. We have learned that in order to be successful in this area, however, we must collaborate not only with universities and schools but also with, and, and districts, but also with other stakeholders. So legislative, financial, and curricular programming, much of which have been proposed today, need to be aligned um, to achieve the des desired results for teacher parity. Innovation is also a key. So we know that, for example, New York City has over um, 28,000 paraprofessionals. And, and tapping into that natural pipeline may be one, one um, effort. I don't have a solution to it, we just know that this is something that we need to continue to work at, and that's um, the beginning work that, we're, that we have seeded with New York City DOE through US PrEP. Data sharing and continuous improvement. So continuous improvement is essential for an agile and sustainable, agile and sustainable systems for the advancement of the profession. The potential for effective improvements is hindered by lack of systemic and ongoing data sharing between New York City Department of Education and our programs. As EPPs um, our account and our account, we are accountable to the public, of course, through national accreditation. But um, we are significantly handicapped, and I'm saying this globally, not necessarily in a one-off institutionally, um, by a lack of transparency of data that could be used to inform our practice. For example, consist, um, regularly understanding the impact of our alumni as they go and work in schools would tremendously help us. So we have to work to get together to reverse this impediment. And then the last would be ongoing advisement and evidence-based and responsive legislative action. So it's great that we're having this conversation today, but how do we make this um, systematic? So too many, on too many occasions, well-intended legislative legislation has yielded unintended consequences that create barriers to innovation and access to quality programs for talented teacher aspirants. For example, currently it costs almost up, up to even more than $1,000 for a teacher to become certified. That's from kid to caboodle, um, and we add in program fees, et cetera, that's even more. So these are real barriers that our candidates face, and um, they directly affect the ability to recruit talented and a diverse pool. Um, in a national study by the American Association for States and Colleges and Universities, 40% of deans indicated that state departments do not regularly consult their peers across the state on policy issues. And while we're talking about the state level, 
this is probably something that you would hear common with most of our deans um, is that we need better communication and collab collaboration across those partners. And so I will stop here because you have the rest of my report, but thank you for this opportunity to have a forum with you. Uh, thank you. Next panelist. Good afternoon, Chair Barron. Thank you to both of you as chairs and to all of the honorable members of both committees for allowing us to testify today. I'm Karen DeMoss and I lead a project called Prepared to Teach out of your, uh, your alum institution, Bank Street College. There are actually three parts of Bank Street. There's a school for children, the graduate school, and a Bank Street Education Center, which works externally on the kinds of challenges that you all have brought to bear to this conversation today, and that's the domain that I work in. I'll be sure and say your hellos, though, to the people over at the graduate school when I get back. In the interest of time, um, because you have so much of the information already that is the research um, portion of the work that we do, I will start my testimony towards the bottom of page two where it's entitled The Importance of Clinical Practice. As with any other profession that requires practitioners to make complex decisions in situations defined by unique contextual and individual factors, becoming an effective teacher requires practice, specifically linking the ever-growing knowledge base on human development, learning sciences, and effective pedagogy with guided, supervised practice that enables deep critique and reflection. In fact, it's the clinical practice portion of preparation that creates the link between questions of quality and diversity. Without strong clinical practice before they become teachers of record, novice teachers are less effective than they could and should be. When, the novice teacher of color, when novice teachers of color are among those who are underprepared, they actually are more likely to leave the profession quickly. I believe earlier you were looking for the number of hours of practice that are required as a minimum by the state. It is 40 hours, one full-time week. Pharmacists, architects, doctors, engineers, hairdressers, nurses, all these professions require a minimum of 1,500 hours of meaningfully supervised professional practice in New York before aspirants are allowed to operate independently. For teachers, though, alternative routes allow the individual to be hired with as little as 40 hours of pre-service work in a classroom, often unsupervised. Federal data indicate that alternative programs in, in New York average 90 hours of practice before they, um, before they are being hired, and traditional programs average over 500. The prior requirement for traditional programs was only 260. So traditional programs, even before the raising of the standard to 455, on average were already exceeding what the state has as a requirement. While still much less than the level of required practice for entry into other professions in New York, traditional programs provide candidates with much more extensive opportunities to build their skills. Graduates from those programs are more likely to stay in the field as teachers, reducing turnover costs that run into the billions every year. That billions is a national number, not a New York City specific number. Without supported extended clinical practice before becoming a teacher of record, aspiring teachers have insufficient opportunities to master the complexities of teaching and learning to practice applying the growing knowledge base of how children and young adults learn, or to reflect on how to adjust their practices to address all students' needs. They lack the time to learn and to apply research-based practices that support students with exceptional needs in emergent bilinguals. They have to rush through important concepts around relationship building, trauma-informed care, and culturally sustaining practices. Learning to teach takes time and the city's students should not have to learn under teachers who themselves have not had the opportunity to learn to teach. The problem is the economic barriers. Addressing the opportunity to learn gap for future teachers is largely an economic issue. This is why our project, Prepared to Teach, exists, is to address the economic challenge of people coming into the profession through quality routes. Most aspiring teachers have, ha have a hard time pursuing their teaching credentials because the required clinical practice is unpaid. Other professions allow entrants to earn money while they are doing their supervised training, but teachers have historically been required to do their full-time, semester-long student teaching for free. That reality creates strong incentives for candidates to enter through quick, cheap pathways since fully 40% of undergraduates and 76% of graduate students work full-time while going to school, and 20% of students who work have dependents. They cannot afford to quit working during clinical placements. 
These economic realities are even more prominent for candidates of color. Recent national data shows that candidates of color enrolled in teacher preparation programs come from homes that have rough incomes of about $45,000, which is less than half of what candidates coming from white backgrounds have on average. To ensure that novice teachers are well prepared to teach and do not opt for quick entry programs which provide them a salary and benefits immediately, um, and to re reflect the full diversity of the city, we have to find ways to minimize financial barriers to entering the profession through strong preparation pathways that set novice teachers up for success with all students in the system. So practice allows them to succeed. These mutually beneficial partnerships, which we did hear some um, discussion of from some of my colleagues on the panel already, um, they actually do make a difference in the funding. Through this hearing, the City Council is asking an important question of how the New York City Department of Education is working with teacher preparation programs to address the city's needs for better prepared and more diverse teachers. The NYC DOE and its partners can point to many examples of high quality partnerships that reflect the kinds of preparation opportunities and focus on areas of high need for the city's new teachers. We applaud these efforts and Bank Street College counts itself among such participants with the New York City DOE. This summer we're launching a new TESOL certificate residency program which will prepare new highly qualified teachers for the city's emergent bilingual students in collaboration with the International's Network and other public schools. Candidates will have a full year of co-teaching alongside an accomplished licensed teacher while being supported with aligned deep learning and reflection associated with Bank Street's programs. Evidence shows that they are more likely to stay. 70 to 90 percent of people who go through residency programs are still in their positions five years later, compared to 30 to 60 percent of people entering through other programs. Most of the residency programs that are currently available in New York City are either unfunded for the candidate, meaning they just have to work longer in their student teaching for free, um, or um, they are funded through grants. What our project is working to do is figure out ways to more sustainably fund this kind of work. Uh, the Comptroller's Office estimate of about another $40 million on top of the, the Teaching Fellows dollars is a really good estimate. There are also some cost savings approaches which many of our partnerships that we support have been able to figure out. They figure out these cost savings through really deep work for a year co-designing programming. When you have a program that's embedded inside a school, they're able to figure out ways to streamline the curriculum because the candidates are immediately applying what they're thinking about. They're actually seeing their work in practice. They're actually learning what their, um, their practices do with their students. And this, the programs find that they actually can reduce the amount of coursework that they have to have. This has happened in several of our partnerships. And because the candidates are truly working in the schools, the schools are able to actually fund the candidates for part of this work. One of the partnerships on Staten Island with the, with the College of Staten Island has found $15,000 per year for eight candidates to be residents inside the school from existing budgets. They're restaffing lines, they're re-proportioning uh, things like professional development dollars, which was one of the questioning lines earlier on. And they're able to provide this to candidates, and in addition, they're able to streamline some of the coursework, which of course reduces the tuition debt for the candidates and also helps people become teachers more quickly. So this is the kind of partnership work that through discussions with the DOE, through new structuring, through reallocation, and then through the sort of cost savings that happen because you're not constantly doing the churn, our students will no longer have as much need for remediation. They won't any longer be held back because they didn't have quality teachers and they will be more college and career ready when they graduate from our high schools. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Next panelist. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, Chairperson Barron and all council members present. My name is Amy Katembo, and I'm the director of the Office of Teacher Education at Teachers College, Columbia University. I'm honored to testify today as administrators and teacher educators at Teachers College, Columbia University, um, we are so pleased that the New York City Council is centering this important discussion about the needs of students with disabilities, English language learners, and students of color. We share your commitments, and we come to the conversation to offer two additional perspectives on how to strengthen teacher preparation in New York City. 
First, it is essential to recognize that learning to teach does not and cannot happen over the course of a single pre-service academic program, but rather teachers continue to learn and grow as they teach. Second, diversifying the teaching force requires a sincere financial commitment on the part of our city and state policymakers. Today, I'd like to highlight some of the work that is happening at Teachers College and offer recommendations on how to strengthen our partnerships. Teachers College is the first and largest graduate school of education in the United States. Today, TC has more than 5,000 students and we prepare more than 500 pre-service teachers annually. The majority of these teachers stay and teach in New York City public schools, the very schools where they did their student teaching. At Teachers College, all teacher education students, regardless of content and grade level, engage in coursework and field experiences that focus specifically on the needs of students with disabilities. We proudly offer a robust degree programs in early childhood and special education, elementary inclusive and special education, applied behavior analysis, intellectual disabilities and autism, bilingual and bicultural education, and teaching English to speakers of other languages, to name just a few. In addition, we share New York City's commitment to recruiting and preparing teachers from backgrounds that are currently underrepresented in the teaching force. This commitment is manifested in recruitment and admissions decisions across Teachers College's 20 plus teacher education programs and is formally supported through scholarships, our Teacher Opportunity Corps program, and a growing number of opportunities for all members of our community to develop their own racial literacy and for aspiring teachers of color to find support, community, and affirmation at Teachers College. We have identified two opportunities to strengthen teacher preparation. The first is we find that teachers, and particularly those serving students with disabilities or students for whom English is a second language, benefit from structured induction support and professional development opportunities long after TC their TC graduation date. We don't see this as a failure of our degree programs, but rather a fact about the nature of teaching Learning to teach effectively takes more than a couple of semesters. We are already engaged in induction with our TR at TC program that's been mentioned here today. Across the first nine years of the program, 97% of TC grads continue to work in induction related fields. We also see a tremendous opportunity to increase public funding aimed at diversifying the teaching force. Strong programs which can benefit from additional funds are already in place. For example, the Teacher Opportunity Corps is a state-funded program specifically designed to increase the number of teachers from underrepresented backgrounds. At Teachers College, this program allows us to support 20 aspiring teachers of color with tuition support, mentorship, professional development opportunities, seminars with faculty, and internships in New York City public schools. What if we had enough funding to support 100 aspiring teachers of color? What if we were able to offer full scholarships to all Teacher Opportunity Corps interns? Our infrastructure is strong and we're ready to grow. There are areas in which we are already poised to support New York City teachers with their in-service learning. We currently offer a wide variety of professional development services for in-service teachers, including workshops on designing accessible curriculum through the Teachers College Inclusive Classrooms Project, induction support through our Center for Professional Education of Teachers, powerful lectures and learning opportunities through our annual Reimagining Education Conference on the teaching and learning in racially diverse schools and the certification extension in bilingual education, just to name a few. In sum, Teachers College has the expertise and the structures to support New York City and its work to teach and affirm all learners, and we stand ready to help. We have templates for strong induction support, and we'd be happy to collaborate with the New York City Department of Ed in developing in-service professional development supports for a broader range of teacher candidates. Possibilities include 
connecting New York City teachers with the many effective workshops and conferences that Teachers College has to offer, co-constructing induction pathways that support and affirm our next generation of teachers, and above all, funding the aspiring teachers whom we most want to see in our classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Next. What do I do? Okay. Come on. We all want to thank you for staying. We now know who really believes these issues are important. Um, my name is Alan Singer. I'm a former New York City high school teacher. I, I, I went to CCNY. I taught at Jeff. I taught at Lane. I taught at IS-292. And I worked at the United Community Centers for many years in your district. Um, I'm a teacher educator now at Hofstra University on Long Island. Many graduates of our School of Education become New York City teachers. Speaking today, I represent my views, not the views of the university. We need to dispel some myths about education and teacher preparation. One, education and teacher preparation are not miracle cures for massive social upheavals. We can make our schools better, but that will not address the over 100,000 New York City school children that are homeless at some point during the school year. The interrupted education of many young people arriving from war zones, the deterioration of public housing, and gentrification that produces overcrowding and general economic distress in poor minority communities like East New York. Two. Initial teacher preparation in the School of Education is not like a one-time vaccination good for the rest of someone's career. At the completion of student teaching, a graduate of a School of Education program is only a certified beginner. The problems described in the call for this meeting, especially better instruction for students with disabilities and English language learners, means an investment in ongoing teacher staff development and daily time set aside for planning teams to coordinate how they will address student learning needs. One teacher in a classroom is not sufficient. New York City needs to hire more teachers. New York State re recommends, but that does not mandate inclusion teachers with two teachers in a classroom. Only specifically designated classrooms with high numbers of students with registered disabilities have an additional teacher. Given the large number of struggling students in New York City schools, 15% are English language learners, more than 20% of IEPs, and many more require 504 support. More than half score in the third to eighth grade, less than satisfactory on math and reading tests, almost every classroom needs a second teacher, whether students have certified disabilities or not. Four, charter schools are not a solution. They are a big part of the problem. Charters are permitted to hire untrained, uncertified people and call them teachers, undermining teacher preparation schools of education. The charter chains were in a Peace Corps type operation, recruiting people from early colleges, predominantly white, who want the New York City experience, who follow scripts and then leave before they learn how to teach. Five, high stakes, multiple choice, qualifying tests for teacher certification do not improve the quality of teaching. Instead, they block potentially excellent minority candidates, especially people who are English language learners themselves from the teaching profession. Drop the tests, let schools of education prepare and evaluate candidates. Six, politically connected alternative certification programs like Teach for America and the Teaching Fellows are the uber of education. They look good until the consequences become clearer. They circumvent efforts by the city and state officials to improve teacher preparation, and many of the people they put in classrooms are temps. And then last, if New York City wants to increase the number of minority educators, it will have to make teaching more financially attractive for people from lower income families. 
provide opportunity scholarships and forgivable loans for local high school graduates that cover living expenses for college students who commit to stu teach in New York schools and especially in high needs areas. When I student taught, I had to go on food stamps. Salaries, I live in the South Bronx and I student taught in the South Bronx. Salaries must go up significantly. A one bedroom apartment in a less desirable area of Brooklyn rents for $2,500 a month, $30,000 a year, more than half of a starting teacher's salary. It will not be easy to address the problems that your committee has called to our attention. A useful start is to at least recognize the depth of the difficulties and the cost of potential solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, and our final panelist. Oh, okay. Here you go. Not finalist, next to final. And we, when, you, when it's your turn, we'll ask people to shift down so that you'll be able to actually have a seat at the table. Good afternoon, Councilwoman Barron. Thank you to both committees on education and higher education for the opportunity to present today. My name is Trina Yearwood. I am a proud product of the New York City Public Schools. I started my career as an educator, as a teacher, uh, English in the New York City Public Schools 20 years ago. I've served the profession as a classroom teacher, literacy coach, a teacher educator, and I am currently the Associate Dean of the School of Education at Long Island University Brooklyn campus. Like Allen, even though I am here as the Associate Dean, I am representing my own views. As we know, the majority of the teacher workforce remains predominantly white, middle class, and female, although U.S. classrooms are becoming increasingly diverse. While there are programs aimed at diversifying the teacher workforce, such as New York State Education Department's Teacher Opportunity Corps Grant and the New York City Men Teach, there must be intentional efforts to diversify teacher education leadership and faculty because the lack of diversity in classrooms mirrors the lack of uh, diversity in teacher education. According to the 2017 American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, AACTE, Colleges of Education report, 84% of deans are white, and the average dean of a college of education is a white woman in her late 50s. Also, approximately 80% of full-time teacher education faculty across ranks are white. Across the nation, districts and education agencies are developing and implementing policies to meet the needs of diverse students. In New York State, the Board of Regents recently introduced the culturally responsive sustaining education framework to ensure that our students have equitable and inclusive learning experiences. Similarly, right here in New York City, the Department of Education's 2019 to 2020 Comprehensive Education Plan seeks to focus education around strengthening models of inclusion and equity where all students can learn and thrive. These initiatives are a good start, but not enough. To truly ensure that all students in New York City have access to equitable learning experiences, regardless of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, orientation, disability, or zip code, we must diversify teacher education, leadership, and faculty. And earlier, uh, Council Member Traeger, he mentioned his desire in wishing that he had other opportunities prior to entering the classroom. And uh, just now, Alan just talked about some of the issues that our students face, homelessness, poverty, um, they are immigrants. We need to have a diverse teaching um, education faculty as well as leadership to ensure that our candidates are being prepared from those diverse backgrounds. Teacher preparation programs prepare the next generation of teachers. If we are truly to prepare teachers who are qualified to teach all children, then attention must be given to the leadership and faculty of teacher preparation programs to ensure they possess the critical consciousness, racial awareness, and cult cultural competence that we expect of our teachers and our P-12 students. Um, I will close by adding, you know, when I was a, in a teacher preparation program, I didn't have one black faculty member. 
and I did not learn about culturally responsive pedagogy or culturally relevant teaching until I was in a doc program. And if we are really, really committed to ensuring that all of our students are receiving the education that they need and that the teachers that are in front of them are highly qualified to teach them, we need to ensure that we also consider diversifying the teacher education faculty and leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our next panelist. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jennifer Pankowski. I am an assistant professor and coordinator of special education for Pace University in Lower Manhattan. Um, as a former city teacher of special education and a individual with disabilities myself, this call is particularly compelling. Advocacy in the areas of inclusion for students with disabilities have changed the landscape for how today's classrooms function. Teacher education programs must adjust to the means to meet the needs of the ever-changing classroom dynamic. At Pace University, the commitment in preparing every teacher to work with a diverse student body is something we take very seriously. Uh, in 2015, Pace redeveloped its core coursework to address inclusive education and supports for students with disabilities in all of our major programs, not just those who are uh, pursuing degrees in special education. In addition, students receive coursework in classroom management and student autonomy, as well as assessment courses, which help prepare every single teacher candidate to understand the special education referral process, the continuum of services, and how to ensure every student is being well educated in the least restrictive environment, regardless of the content area they will be t teaching as a certified teacher. Uh, we have also included the term inclusive education in all of our programs, and we have focused our efforts in the area of TESOL, teaching English to students of other language, and language learning for all programs as well, with the inclusion of coursework that is focused on early language development and teaching reading to students with disabilities. As someone with dyslexia myself, I can appreciate what has been commented upon earlier, that the key to helping support these students lies in early language development. P students have several language courses and also a sensitivity to global perspectives in all of their coursework. Another opportunity is one of our faculty members recently received a grant to help support individuals looking to seek certification in TESOL and bilingual education that is supported by the state because we understand that that is a limitation for uh, many individuals in this area wanting to pursue degrees. We also have strong partnerships in uh, the Department of Education through our uh, Director of School Partners, and we have early intensive field experiences that are scaffolded for both graduate and undergraduate programs. For undergrads, we start placing them in the field in their sophomore year, one day per week, and that escalates until their senior year where they're in the field every single day, all day. In our graduate program, we have similar scaffoldings where they begin observing in the classrooms from their very first semester until they're in full-time student teaching in their second year or third year, depending on how um, intensive their program is, meaning how many classes they're taking at a time. Uh, finally, I wanted to address the concern of this committee with re regard to representing our students of color and our s teacher educators of color and diverse backgrounds. I can recall when I first started at Pace six years ago, the New York City Teaching Fellows had a subway campaign, and I continue to see that the fellows represent our most diverse workforce. So it's important for us to look and see why they're recruiting such a diverse group, while in our traditional setting, they remain to be predominantly, like myself, white, middle class, female. It is important for us as institutions of higher education to focus on how to support diverse teachers and diverse teacher candidates by exploring what is important to these candidates and where we can um, be part of their lives. Um, there are great programs like Men Teach, but I don't think they're widely enough um, recruited for and advertised. So I think that it's important for us to continue to advertise these programs to pursue a wider audience. Another thing that is um, 
an interesting perspective on diversity in the classroom is when I was a classroom teacher in special education, I noticed support staff was always diverse. Paraprofessionals always represented various ages, races, religion, and gender. Yet somehow that's being lost with continuing to become full-time classroom teachers. So I think that we need to explore more supports for these individuals to continue on to becoming fully certified teachers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for your testimony. I do have questions for you, and if you could each answer them, if you have the information, that would be very helpful. So do you track your students after they graduate? And if you do, what percent, I know one of the panelists gave us the percentage of those that remain in education fields. But do you track your graduates? And if you do, do you know what percentage of them remain in education, either in the classroom or education-related fields? And do you know what percent go to New York uh, DOE schools? So if you go in the same order, then I'm trying to record it so that I have it. We do. I don't have it directly, so I'll have the I'll okay. check with our research center and sent it on. Okay, great. I have the check as well. So I, I okay. just finished one year, but I do know from one report, 80% of our, pretty much 80% of our graduates are in DOE. Are in DOE, okay. We have a recent evaluation of Bank Street's historic programs, and we'll send that on to you. Okay. We do not track all of our um, grads, but we do track um, the teaching residence program, which was the number that I gave right. earlier, um, and it's roughly 97%. Okay. And it's all Department of Ed schools. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry, do I have to push this? Um, we, we do track up to six years. I don't have that information with me, um, but I can send the link. That's okay. all public information because we're going through our CAPE accreditation. So that's on the PACE uh, School of Education website. But we track program completers up to six years after they leave us. Okay. Most of our students in New York City go into the Department of Education. We are a uh, dual campus, so our Pleasantville uh, campus has fewer students that are going into the Department of Education. But they also have students that are going into areas like the Bronx in that location. We do not track, uh, but the majority of our graduates go into the New York City uh, Department of Education. Mm -hmm. Given the tuition that they pay, they all stay in teaching. About 20% go into New York City schools, the Hofstra's on Long Island. Okay. Uh, thank you. And what's the demographic breakdown of the teaching faculty at your institution, someone made reference to that towards the end. So, and we know that it's a problem in the DOE. So at your institution, where teachers are being prepared to go into inner city or it being prepared to go into teaching situations, what percent of your institution I don't think your microphone's on. Sorry. I'm so used to having a loud voice that I don't. Yes, it is, but we need to get it. I know, no, I don't hear other. Yeah. Um, we, uh, just under 70% of our faculty, um, again, look, uh, as I do, are, are identify as white. Um, we and then in your answer, also tell me if your institution has any plans or programs yeah. to. We, we've made at. significant, uh, I would say in the last, um, five to 10 years, significant changes. What uh, keeps the number still high is the, re is the lack of retirement. Uh, so um, um, I can get you the exact data, but the, uh, a much higher number of the most recent uh, hirings in the teacher education faculty and full time is significantly uh, not uh, white compared to, um, uh, but we still have a large uh, older faculty uh, that keeps that percentage higher. So again, I'm just finishing my first year, predominantly white, I would say in single digit non-white. Um, but we do have a strategic initiative. So for each search committee, the committee has to be diverse racially and ethnically. 
that sometimes is a challenge because we often will have um, faculty members or staff members from other units on the committee and the pool of applicants who are recommended to my office has to be diverse as well. So we have seen a shift in our staff um, staffing lines, but not so much faculty because we don't have a, a high turnover rate of faculty. Okay. At Bank Street, the staff and the students are primarily white and female. The institution has a very robust um, racial, race and cult race, cultural and equity um, orientation that uh, actually, we have a representative here who leads that work across the institution in the School for Children, the Graduate School, and um, the, the Bank Street Education Center. And the school has uh, increased since the strategic planning effort for the 100th year anniversary, um, fundraising so that people can afford to come to Bank Street from all sorts of backgrounds. I would say that Teachers College is very similar to NYU um, with our older faculty members being predominantly white, but there's a great deal of change now and we have more and more teacher faculty members of color. Um, at Pace we have a fairly small full-time faculty, um, roughly 20 individuals. Um, of that 75% um, make up our Caucasian or white faculty, 10% uh, African American, 5% Middle Eastern, 5% Asian, and 5% Hispanic. Um, like some of the other universities, we are seeing a strong shift here. Um, also, one of the things that we're doing is um, recruiting a lot of our diverse former students and inviting them in to become adjunct faculty. Uh, last year, I had three African American male a uh, former student that now are um, adjunct and they're teaching our graduate courses. So we are seeing a shift in that uh, quicker than we are for full-time faculty, primarily because of uh, the small number of people who hold that degree. Um, of our full-time faculty, about 75% are white. 25, about what? 75% are white, 25% black and Latino. In the Hofstra Department of Teaching, Learning, Technology, one-third of the tenured full-time faculty are non-white. Not One-third non-white, hmm? is that what you said? Non one-third is non-white. Okay, and what kind of efforts do you know, what kind of efforts are being made, made? to? Well, I, at this point, we, we haven't hired anybody new in a couple of years. The, look, it depends on who's in charge. I'm, right now, I'm chair of the department. I put the priority on people with uh, long-term teaching experience. Uh, I, a, a lot of the adjuncts are people I taught with in, in New York City schools. And so we want people who work in to teach teachers who have worked in these schools. Um, our major partnership district is Uniondale, which has a uh, demographic very similar to Brooklyn, actually. And uh, so our, our students have significant experience working with uh, immigrant students, with English language learners, and working mm -hmm. with African American Caribbean students. Yeah. Okay, and, and I do have to say that when I went to Bank Street, mm -hmm. I did get a partial scholarship at Bank Street. And since I went to a school uh, that was in a high needs area, I was able to get the loan canceled each year that I worked. So I wound up not having to uh, repay that in financial terms. And just finally, um, how, would you, how would you give me a breakdown, if you can, of how your institution balances, uh, the, the chair had talked about pedagogy versus the content area. How would you say your institution balances that out, the pedagogy, versus or compared to the content area? Um, so I think traditionally we actually lean more towards the pedagogy uh, than uh, the content. Uh, we've actually tried to, uh, in again, the most recent master's residency program, balance it out where each intern has two mentors, a pedagogical um, director who visit, who's regularly in the schools and a content specific, I call them the so what faculty, 
that every time they're studying something tries to contextualize it to teaching in that content. And then the pedagogical uh, faculty who's in the schools supports that working with the schools directly. So we are actually, um, this is a good question because um, we, we are revamping all of our curriculum since I arrived and we have the model of leading and learning from praxis, which is the integration of theory and practice and serving with compassion. And so actually this Friday we will be um, doing a deep dive of looking at um, all of the courses and, and what's in those courses according to standards and, and, and et cetera. But um, our survey results from clinical practice are pretty high in terms of students feeling as though they're well prepared. Um, they're, but we're still looking at those issues of, on the faculty, because I think faculty have also raised that question of what is the, um, the talk between the two that is not something that necessarily is rests in the heads of faculty, but that we make it transparent for our candidates as well. Right. All of Bank Street's programs use what you probably remember, the developmental interactive approach. And in that kind of work, um, each student, where he or she is, whether that's your graduate student or a student in your P-12 school, um, each student's developmental level becomes part of the curriculum and the pedagogical opportunity and need. And so through reflective practice, through trying to understand where a particular student is, your graduate student, um, because it's only graduate programs at Bank Street, um, or your P-12 student, understanding how you interact with where that person is in terms of where that person needs to go is the framework for all of the both content and pedagogy work at Bank Street. Um, I would say, though, I would defer to one of my faculty members if he or she corrected me. <laughs> And at Teachers College, it's more pedagogy than content. Um, each program differs slightly um, with our teaching residency having the most pedagogy out of all of the programs. At Pace, we're um, negotiating both a collaboration of content and pedagogy. We are a, an accredited university and we're preparing teachers to be uh, state accredited, so it's important that we provide them with the content, but we're also a very clinically rich program. We even have opportunities for our graduate coursework to be taught in the field at schools to have that clinically rich experience while also negotiating the content being important for the state exams. So they, all, all of the institutions have got to meet those standards to make sure the students are, are prepared for the exams. That's ultimately how we're going to get there. But so what would you, how would you uh, present the uh, balance between them? Is it, were you saying 50-50 or are you going to say more? Per Percentage-wise, I would say it's probably a one-thirds, two-thirds. One-thirds. One-third based on content and two-thirds based on pedagogy. Okay. A lot of our students um, are graduate students, so they're receiving a lot of the content in their bachelor's degree. Um, okay. However, when they need those supports, we offer workshops if we need to fill in any missing components that they didn't receive either in high school or in their bachelor's degree prior to coming to us. But it's a very clinically rich, so pedagogy is incredibly important. Okay. Same thing, it's, it's um, more focused on the pedagogy. Uh, most of our students are graduate students as well. They are required if they're deficient to, to make up those credits in the content areas, but uh, there is mostly a focus on pedagogy. We have a, a 37 credit master's degree. Of 37 credits, nine credits in social studies or in any of the secondary areas focuses on content, but the other 28 credits is basically on pedagogy. I'm the chair of the department, but my primary responsibility is secondary social studies. One of the ways that we integrate pedagogy and content is I do the field supervision for the student teachers. I'm out in the schools with them, and when they're, they, most of their cooperating teachers are my former students, so there's a seamless presentation. And when I'm in the schools, I also do demonstration lessons with the middle school and high school kids to show the pre-service teachers how you translate uh, content and skills into classroom practice. 
Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate, thank you. I, I appreciate your uh, input and your staying and your patience, and uh, we look forward to using this information as we go forward. This is not just a panel to just say, okay, this is what it is, but to look to see how your information can help us shape moving forward that we can improve the teachers that are coming in, that they're better qualified, more confident and comfortable, and say, yes, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. You want to take a picture to yourself? <laughs> no, I have a okay. girl, you know, use my turn, please. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll just make that happen. And we're going to call our next panel. Our next panel is Thomas Shepard from District 11, Paulette Healy from District Parent uh, CCSE, Paula White, an educator, from ex an educator for excellence, Philippa Bishop Alexandra from Ecuador, Educators for Excellence, Rachel, I think that's Fisher. You can correct me when you get up. Um, e for E, Educators for Excellence, New York, and Dan Gannon, also Educators for Excellence. Okay, okay. I'm going to ask Mr. Shepard to go first because I understand you've got some young ones with you, and. We appreciate your staying, and if you could make your presentations in a concise manner, we would certainly be appreciative because we do still have another panel to come behind you. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Do you want to begin? And if you have to leave after you do that because of your children, we understand that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the committee for offering me the opportunity to testify before you. My name is Thomas Shepard and I'm a dad of six children, three of which are current students in New York City Public Schools. I am a parent member of the District 11 Community Education Council and an education advocate in the Bronx. As a parent, I've been advocating of issues, equal access to education for families in my community for several years. Among those is the issue of ensuring that all of our schools and especially those in our most underserved communities in the Bronx have access to highly qualified teachers. Schools in the Bronx in general, District 11 in particular, have well over 90% black and Latinx student populations. In District 11, our students and families represent cultures from the Caribbean, Central and South America, Africa, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, Asia, and various places throughout the United States. With these cultures come many different languages, customs, and traditions. But with the richness and diversity in our community also come some very big challenges. Chief among those is poverty. Physical inequities such as food, housing, and economic insecurity, underfunded and dilapidated schools, and social inequities such as schools to prison pipelines exist in part because of the lack of teacher development in our community. For example, student achievement is directly linked to curriculums that educators are responsible for teaching to our children. If educators are unprepared to teach that curriculum to our children, then student achievement declines and the achievement, achievement gap widens. The implementation of Common Core Standards is a prime example of this. Teachers were almost completely unprepared to teach this curriculum to our children, and every measure of student achievement reflected it. A priority, a priority of Chancellor Carranza is the implementation of a culturally responsive and sustaining education for all New York City public school students. A successful implementation of this type of education model hinges on teachers being prepared to teach it and not in a haphazard way, but in a deliberate and planned way that includes giving our schools and teachers the resources they need to do this in a way that does not repeat the mistakes of the past. While this committee cannot address 
all of the social and economic barriers that exist in our community. It can address the barriers that make it extremely difficult for our children to receive the education they need to transcend poverty and have a better life as adults. Again, I want to thank the committee for allowing me the opportunity to testify, and I'll be happy to answer any questions the committee may have for me in response to my statement. Thank you. Next panelist. Uh, thank you very much for having this oversight hearing and allowing parents to uh, lend their voices to um, this particular subject. Uh, teacher preparation and training is incredibly important. Would you give us your name for the record, please? I'm so sorry. My name is Paulette Hahili. Uh, I am a parent in District 20. Uh, my son attends a District 75 school. My daughter attends uh, the Bay Ridge School of Arts in Bay Ridge. And I am a newly elected member of the Citywide Council for Special Education. Um, that being said, uh, I've learned a lot just sitting at, as an audience member in this meeting and hearing the amazing um, solutions that are being presented. Um, what I don't hear is any accountability for administration or district leaders to be held accountable for the same um, training that the teachers are being held accountable for. You can give every teacher who applies and goes into the program the best training and the best certifications that you could possibly give them, but if the leader in these schools are from a different um, mind frame and that is the person who is steering the ship, they can contradict all of the training that these teachers are coming in for. And unfortunately, in our district, we are seeing that. We are seeing the same type of disparity that we're seeing in terms of our, dist our administrators are not reflecting the, um, the demographics within their schools. They, are, they need more bias training than, than the teachers do at this point, and it's really unfortunate. Uh, the state released two different reports in the past two weeks, one in regards to recognition schools and one in regards to IEP comp uh, compliance. And District 20 was reflected in both. We had schools that showed up in recognition, which is for our gifted and talented programs and the fact that we have a very low opt-out rate in our district. But in terms of IEP compliance, we were one of the worst. The citywide average is 24%, and District 20 ranked at 38% noncompliance for IEP. So this is a reflection of where the district is putting their, their uh, emphasis, which is on gifted and talented programs, and they are failing our children with special needs. Um, that being said, um, our own experience within our schools has been incredibly divisive. We have a large um, Arab community within our, uh, com uh, our demographics. We have a large Latinx community within our school population and their needs are not being addressed. There is no cultural diversity in our school. We do not celebrate Black History Month. We do not celebrate His um, Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, we have schools that are literally three blocks away from us that are. So every school, their leader is being, is allowing to dictate the cultural references in their schools, and there should be some type of consistency throughout our district. So being that this emphasis has been on making sure that our teachers are getting the uh, racial diversity trainings and the sensitivities for not only cultural and racial and gender and IEPs, but our administration and our district should be held to the same standard as well. And um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Next panelist. Good afternoon, and thank you, uh, committee chairs. I know one is in absentia. Uh, committee Chair Strager and Barron and the members of the committees on education and higher education for hearing my testimony today. My name is Paula L. White. I am the Executive Director of Educators for Excellence New York. We're an educator-led teacher advocacy organization with over 14,000 New York City public school teachers as members. I know that teacher preparation and training is one of many issues that you are called to focus on, but it is of paramount importance to my work and to all educators. As a former teacher myself and as a school improvement leader, I know that teachers want to get teacher training right, and I know that students need us to get teacher training right. 
Teachers choose the profession for the best of reasons, and so we owe the best to them in return. But so far, that's not what they've got. And that is why over the last year, E4E New York members came together to select teacher preparation and professional development as the next critical issues to address. A team of 23 educators developed a series of recommendations and published a paper, um, which we have submitted for the record, ready for day one and beyond, on how the city and state can ensure that all teachers entering our classrooms are prepared and continually supported throughout their career. The New York City Department of Education hires approximately 6,500 new educators yearly but they overwhelmingly do not share the backgrounds of the students that they are teaching. 83% of the city's students are students of color, compared to 39% of teachers being teachers of color. Almost 20% of our students are students with disabilities, and the city's student population is one of the most linguistically and socioeconomically diverse in the country. New educators are expected to meet the needs of these students, but in far too many instances, inadequate preparation and poorly designed field experiences fail to equip them to do so. But it doesn't have to be this way. When New York City and New York State policymakers prioritize fixing these problems, educators will be ready for day one in the classroom. Today, Three Educators for Excellence New York members will share their personal experiences that underscore why the recommendations our members are proposing are so critical for driving improvement. Philippa Bishop Alexander, a middle school educator in Brooklyn, will tell you why the New York City Department of Education must invest in partnering with and incentivizing teacher preparation programs to train more excellent teachers of color to work in our schools. Rachel Fishkus, a high school English teacher in the Bronx, will share her experience in a teacher residency program and how the expansion of such programs will ensure that educators bring extensive classroom experience to their first official day leading a classroom. And finally, Dan Gannon, a high school social studies educator in the Bronx, will talk about his experience preparing to become an educator and how the city and state must push for better results and support from teacher preparation programs. These teacher stories are not unique. Rather, they serve to amplify the voices of many in their profession who are not here with us today. I remember February 2019 report, Ready for Day One and Beyond, has been submitted to the committees for your consideration. We know what works, and we're here to help. As you move forward, e for e stands ready to provide additional testimony and connection to educators in the field. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thank you, committee chairs Barron and Traeger and the members of the Committee on Higher Education for hearing my testimony today. My name is Philippa Bishop Alexander. I am currently an educator in Brooklyn. I am here to highlight and elevate an issue that teacher preparation programs can and must be a part of the solution to the diversity of our city's workforce. I moved to New York City as an immigrant when I was 11 years old. And I spent my time as a seven, and now I've spent my time as a 17 year veteran in the education field in the New York City Department of Education. I'm proud to be both a teacher and a product and a part of our public school system. When I moved to New York City, I was alone without the support of my parents. Neither of my parents knew how to read or write but they instilled in me at a very young age the need for education. I threw myself into learning. 
Luckily, I had teachers, coaches, and counselors at my New York City public school. I was fortunate enough to go to Wingate. I was bused across town because that was my choice looking for a great opportunity. There were a dynamic group of educators who showed me the beautiful complexity and uniqueness of humanity, lessons that couldn't be taught but came from knowing me as a student more deeply. Unfortunately, in most of the diverse cities in the world, nearly all of the teachers are white. The beautiful complexity of humanity I learned in New York City Public School was missing a crucial aspect. I've studied in Japan, I've studied in Senegal, West Africa, I've been fortunate enough to study across continents. Teachers of color are needed in every classroom. Teachers that look like me and teachers that look like each and every diverse student in our classroom. As I grow older, I started questioning why the leadership in my classrooms lacked the racial diversity that I know I needed in my classroom as a student and now as an educator. Those questions led me to become an educator myself. As a veteran educator, I now get to see how having a diverse school staff impacts all students. I've had the pleasure of working in the Bronx for 14 years, two years in Brooklyn, and heading back to the DOE in the Bronx. When a teacher shares a similar background to a student, they're able to infuse that shared experience into the curriculum, and the learning experience we provide to students become more powerful. Studies back this up. John Hopkins found that the black students who have, who have just one black teacher in elementary school makes them not only significantly more likely to graduate high school, but also enroll in college. Despite these advantages, our city teachers' work workforce is only 39% teachers of color, while our student population is an incredible 83% students of color. New York City can make a difference. Every year, New York State, New York State prepares nearly 10% of all American educators, and our city recruits and hires thousands of new educators into our schools. Enough new educators to staff entire school districts in our cities. I believe that if the New York City Department of Education uses its power as the largest employer of educators in America, to partner with teacher preparation programs that are excellent, and I have a teaching fellows background, so I do support teacher preparation programs such as the teaching fellows. In America, to partner with teacher preparation programs that are excellent at not only recruiting and enrolling future educators of color, but also preparing them, not just in the beginning of their career, but in the middle and at the end, to be the excellent educators, the, the, the statistics I shared with you would shift dramatically. In New York City, in the Department of Education, it sets the expectation that programs that prepare educators to teach in New York City public school have plans, strategies, and a focus on recruiting great teachers of color. We can begin to close the educator racial diversity gap in New York City and across the country and more little girls like myself will have teachers at the front of their classrooms who look like them. We have that power, and I believe it's time for us to make it a priority. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you. Next panelist. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you, committee chairs Traeger and Barron, and the members of the committees on education and higher education for hearing my testimony today. My name is Rachel Fishkus, and I am a high school teacher in the Bronx. Today, I'd like to talk about how the city can ensure every educator is ready on day one by promoting and growing teacher residency programs. When I entered my classroom in 2015 as a full-time instructional leader, I walked in with two years of instructional experience under my belt. That was thanks to my participation in the Blue Engine Relay Graduate School of Education Residency Program a program that partners with the New York City Department of Education to provide future educators the experience of becoming an instructional leader through real-world, in-school work as an educator. 
Traditional preparation programs place a heavy focus on theoretical coursework that often feels disconnected from the realities that teachers face when they enter the classroom for the first time. Despite this emphasis, Educators for Excellence New York found in a survey of New York City educators that only 29% reported feeling very well prepared to provide rigorous instruction as a first year educator. Furthermore, the vast majority of preparation programs in the state of New York provide limited classroom experience to future teachers. And that experience is often in classrooms that do not reflect the range of socioeconomic, racial, and ability diversity that is typical in a New York City public school. In the first year of my residency, I worked to support an experienced teacher and taught full time as a small group instructor. I was able to grow and continually receive feedback from excellent educators at my school. In my second year, I continued as a small group instructor, but started taking graduate school coursework and began lead teaching certain classes. Like any good educator, they were able to support me as I grew in instructional confidence and gradually released me into additional responsibilities as an educator. My role in the classroom continued to grow while still being supported by a mentor who gave constant feedback until I was nearly a full-time classroom teacher. My classroom was a classroom. From the first day of my residency, I was in classrooms and supporting students with disabilities, students who are learning English as a new language, and students representing the incredible diversity of our city schools. On my first day as a full-time educator in 2015, I was neither shocked nor overwhelmed by the complexities of teaching in New York City public schools because I had two entire years of experience that prepared me to be a successful classroom leader. Throughout that first year, my colleagues were often surprised to learn that I was a new teacher. This doesn't seem like your first year, they would tell me, because thanks to my residency training, it really wasn't. In our neighborhoods with the most students of color and highest rates of poverty, nearly 25% of educators have fewer than three years of experience, compared to just 15% in communities with more white, affluent students. That means the teacher burnout and turnover in these schools is a very real problem. Because of my experience in a residency program, my first years in the classroom were not spent on the exhausting exercise of attempting to marry the pedagogical theory provided by most preparation programs with the realities of teaching. Instead, thanks to my practical residency training, I was able to confront the majority of the challenges of being a new teacher, and I was able to dodge the early career burnout that afflicts so many of my more traditionally trained peers. I am proud to say that, thanks to the solid foundation provided by my residency experiences, next year will be my sixth year at the same school, and I plan to continue teaching in the Bronx for as long as possible. Because of New York City's size and number of new teachers it hires each year, it can play a significant role in financially investing in growing and expanding teacher residency programs. By creating in-house programs or partnering with high quality organizations, the New York Department of Education can ensure that every new teacher walking to our schools is ready on day one. Thank you for your consideration and I look forward to partnering with you to ensure that more educators are able to experience the quality training I received in my teacher residency. Thank you. What did you say was the name of the residency program? Uh, it was the Blue Engine Relay Graduate School okay. of Education program. It's mostly through uh, Relay Graduate School of Education. Thank you. Next panelist. Good afternoon, and thank you, Committee Chair Barron, for hearing my testimony today. My name is Daniel Gannon, and I'm currently a high school educator in the South Bronx. I would like to speak with you today about the need to hold our teacher preparation programs accountable for being transparent and providing a high quality education to New York City's future educators. Our future teachers, and most importantly, our future students, deserve the improvements I'm speaking to you about today. I was trained as an educator in a graduate education program based in Westchester County. At the time, I had no reason to doubt the quality of the preparation I was receiving. I had just finished my undergrad degree and chose to stay at my school because it seemed good enough and would certify me in the field I wished to teach, which was high school social studies. It was only until well into the program that I began to see some of its flaws. The program included two portions of in-classroom experience, a two-week internship at a school and a 12-week formal student teaching experience. Neither opportunity provided me the chance to work extensively with a diverse group of uh, students, but what was most disappointing was that half of my preparation experience was spent in a classroom that did not align with my certification area. Finally, when it came time to search for a job, the messaging for my preparation program was explicitly, 
go cut your teeth in the city for a few years, and then come back to Westchester. That was the extent of the job placement support I received. Now, as a veteran teacher, I'm able to see how this sort of advice creates a system where brand new teachers with minimal experience are funneled to our most high need schools to merely leave after two to three years and return to classrooms that are coded as easier to educate. Often we look to schools to solve high teacher turnover, but the reality is that the educators are being embedded with the expectation that short stints in high need schools is the norm before they even step foot in a classroom. I rejected that advice and continued to proudly work in the South Bronx nine years later. My experience led me to joining the Educators for Excellence New York educator-led policy team focused on improving teacher preparation. I believe that New York City Department of Education and the New York State Education Department must require that preparation programs that prepare teachers for our public schools be transparent with the experience and outcomes they produce for educators. Right now in New York, an aspiring educator has no access to any information about teacher preparation program outcomes. There is no public data about the demographics of program participants, where and what type of schools graduates end up teaching in, what their average salaries are, what certification areas do educators graduate and begin their career in, or how long their graduates remain in education. All of these helpful data points are easily accessible in New Jersey and many other states, yet not in New York. With the sunlight of additional preparation program transparency, educators like myself can make informed decisions about which preparation programs fit the type of educator they wish to become. Ideally, I could have selected a program that has real life training experience, high rates of graduation and placement in communities like the Bronx, ensuring that I was ready on day one of my teaching career to help my students get the type of education they rightfully deserve. Being a teacher is already an extremely difficult job to do, but improving our preparation programs by becoming more forthcoming with information about these programs should only help educators start their careers on a strong foundation and put the best prepared professionals in front of our students on day one. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. We appreciate your testimony, and uh, we hope that we'll be able to come forth with some really pertinent changes that will address the issues that you brought, and based on your experiences that you've shared with us about how successful the residency program was. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. I have a quick question. Um, and it's not like a question towards you. It's just more like a, a statement. It's, it's funny that um, in District 11, for example, we have about 45 schools, and then 42 of them are like Title I schools, right? And a condition for a school receiving Title I funding is that the teachers in those schools be highly qualified, not just certified, but highly qualified. And I've been listening to testimony all day about this revolving door of teachers. Um, and for me, it just seems like we're not drawing a distinction between teachers that are certified and teachers that are highly qualified. And in the Bronx, for example, when you know, some schools have a quarter or more of their teaching populations walk out of the door every year, then it just seems to me like we'll never have a school full of highly qualified teachers. And I just, I'm trying to figure out in this, where do we go um, to make sure that um, whatever we put in place or however we structure this um, addresses this in not just a, a sort of short-term way, but in a long-term sort of sustainable way where we don't have to continue to revisit or recreate the wheel. I think a part of that solution is what we've heard here today in terms of being able to retain highly effective teachers, not have teachers come in and do their um, introductory teaching and then go off, which means we've got to make teaching a much more lucrative um, profession, 
in terms of the finances and be able to retain teachers. And yes, in fact, devise a way in which we can assign highly effective teachers to those Title I areas, which is in fact what they're supposed to have in terms of making sure that they can boost their students' performance. So that's what we have to look at. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're going to call the next panel. Uh, Denny Salas, Bronx Better Learning Charter School. Penny Marzelli, Prospect Charter Schools. Crystal McQueen Taylor, Uncommon Schools. Uh, Lori Podvester, Include New York. Maggie Moroff, Arise Coalition. Tasfia Rahman, Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. And Gregory, Greg Waltman, G1 Quantum. This is our last panel, yes. And as I did with the previous panel, I do ask that you be succinct in your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and um, as I have been, I'll start with the panelists on my right. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Traeger, Chairman Barron, and the rest of the committee members present here today. I'm Denny Salas, Director of Public Relations and Development for the Bronx Charter Schools for Better Learning, otherwise known as BBL, and I'm pleased to be here today to testify on teacher preparation and training. BBL is a charter school located in City School District 11 in the Northeast Bronx, serving over 700, 750 students from pre-K through fifth grade at our two locations. For the 2015-16 school year, the 2016-17 school year, and the 2017-18 school year, BBL is rec recognized as a reward school by the New York State Education Department, which means we're a high academic achievement school rated among the top 20% in the state for ELA and math performance. Moreover, for this past school year, 18-19 school year, we were recently identified as a recognition school by the New York State Education Department, placing us among the top 12% of elementary schools in New York State. Um, recognition schools display high academic achievement, significant student progress, and strong graduation rates. Our student success and progress can never be realized if our institution did not place a premium on teacher pre preparation and training. At BBL, we have a professional development staff comprised of four individuals and who spend around 50 hours a week on development and training. In addition to our professional development staff, we have 10 academic leaders comprised of teachers who excel in the classroom who serve as an extension of our development team. We also have six consultants that work with both our entire academic staff and professional development team throughout the year. During the course of the year, our principals, professional development team, and academic leaders perform classroom observations that vary in frequency depending on how long the individual teacher has been with our school to, to, deter to, excuse me, to determine if additional training and preparation are needed. A newer teacher is typically observed weekly by our professional development staff and four times a year by our, by our principals. A teacher with over five years of service at BBL are typically observed on a biweekly basis by our professional development staff and once a year by our principals. If a teacher is struggling in the classroom, our professional development team and ac academic leaders work with the teacher to determine where their area of improvement lies. If it is a classroom management issue, our academic leaders will assist the teacher in developing better systems and structures or help the teacher create a behavior plan if it is in regards to a disruptive student. If it is determined to be a lesson execution and content knowledge issue, our academic leaders and professional development team will rearrange a teacher's schedule and work with them to solidify their mastery of the subject matter. In addition to the aforementioned, our professional development team and academic leaders have weekly lunch meetings and weekly after school meetings to discuss any training and preparation needs. These sessions are primar primarily used to solicit feedback from our teachers on classroom performance and share best practices. The bottom line is our school administration and board of trustees will do whatever we can to ensure our teachers are fully prepared and ready to succeed in the classroom. We do this because we know that, it, that if our teachers are succeeding, then our students will succeed, and that is what matters most to us. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony to the committee. We hope our city council can extract information from schools like ours and apply those successes to district schools, ev district schools everywhere. 
the student, wherever they are, deserve the best teachers and the best educational instruction possible to reach their full potential. I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Our next panelist. Good afternoon, Councilmember Barron. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, I'm Maggie Morroff. I'm the coordinator of the Arise Coalition. Our members, um, we have over uh, almost 40 organizational members and over 50 individual members have been working together for over 10 years to push for systemic changes to special ed here, improving the day-to-day -day experiences and long-term outcomes for students with disabilities in New York City public schools. I also happen to work as the Special Education Policy Coordinator at Advocates for Children, but I'm here today on behalf of Arise, and I'm here to talk about the need to train and provide ongoing support to public school teachers to prepare them to give all students, including those with dyslexia and other disabilities, appropriate evidence-based literacy instruction grounded in the science of reading. I am not gonna read my entire testimony, but I'm gonna give you some highlights from it. Um, because ensuring that all students learn to read needs to be one of the city's top educational priorities, teachers need to be prepared with the skills that they need in order to provide instruction in phonemic awareness and phonics, both of which, as, Council, as Assembly Member Simon said before, um, Research has definitely shown beneficial for all students and absolutely necessary for students with dyslexia. Students who can't read are gonna struggle in all academic areas beyond reading. They're gonna avoid reading and they're gonna fall quickly behind their peers who are reading on grade, le grade level. The further they fall behind, the more likely it is that they're gonna leave school unprepared for adult life. And far, far too many students with and without specific literacy-based disabilities are currently in danger of doing exactly that. So it's critical that we don't blame the students or their disabilities. Um, again, as Assembly Member Simon said before, more often than not, the issue is that their teachers haven't been taught effectively to teach the students the skills that they need to learn to read. And the answer here is pretty simple. Teachers need the skills to teach literacy across the spectrum of learners and across grade levels. And just as students aren't expected to teach themselves, neither should their teachers be expected to figure it out for themselves. Uh, we suggest that the city look at places like the Teaching Fellows Program and teacher training programs at CUNY, where it can influence teacher preparation so that teachers come to their classrooms better prepared, as we've heard from so many today. We also suggest that the city consider creating paid apprenticeships in literacy at the DOE. We support the DOE's current efforts to improve literacy instruction for students in early childhood grades, but we also remind everybody that we can't neglect the students in third through 12th grades who still struggle with foundational reading skills. And most often, as I said before, that's because they haven't been given the proper instruction in the earlier grades. Arise members are, are confident that with adequate resources, with dedicated teacher preparation, and a strong commitment from all, that school staff won't be left alone to try to teach their students to read, that students won't have to struggle, and their families won't need to turn to private schools and to private tutors um, when and where they can because they fear that their children are in danger of leaving school not reading. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next panelist. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this important oversight hearing on teacher preparation and training. My name is Lori Podvesker, and I lead the policy work for Include NYC. We testify today to highlight the need for the city to better address the gaps in teacher education programs and provide ongoing training and support to all teachers, paraprofessionals, and substitutes so they are adequately prepared to educate and assist the nearly 300,000 students with disabilities in New York City. We believe there is a direct relationship between the lack of formal education and continuing disability in special education professional development with the inferior proficiency and graduation rates of students with disabilities. Additionally, robust teacher preparation and ongoing training would allow for the integration of students with disabilities with their general education peers, supporting the least restrictive environment for all students. According to the American Community Survey, an annual survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau, the overall percentage of people with disabilities in the United States in 2016 was 12.8 percent, 
yet over 20% of the 1.1 million students in New York City public schools are classified as students with disabilities. We believe general education teachers may over-refer students for evaluation for special education supports and services because teacher preparation programs lack sufficient education on identifying the basic characteristics of learning, behavioral, and cognitive disabilities and on how to distinguish students who may be falling behind for other reasons such as limited ang English language skills. As a result of the city's special education reform initiative launched in 2012 to increase the time students with disabilities spend in general education classrooms, more students with disabilities than ever before are being educated in integrated co-teaching classrooms in New York City. While we applaud this integration, in addition to adequate teacher preparation, general education teachers also need ongoing professional development on how to meet the academic and environmental needs of students with diverse learning styles so they are able to support all students in their classrooms. And again, this should include all professionals working with our students, including paraprofessionals and substitute teachers in which District 75 has the highest percentage of teachers who are absent in the entire pool of teachers in the city. Although ICT school placements have grown, 57,000 students with disabilities in New York City still spend more than 40% of their school day in self-contained classrooms in the most recent data released to you folks from the Department of Education. We believe more students with disabilities could be educated in less restrictive environments if teachers, power professionals, and substitutes were better paired prepared with additional curriculum and behavioral training and support. As a result, we recommend that the Department of Education require annual professional development and ongoing school-based support on basic characteristics of disabilities, especially learning, emotional, intellectual, physical, ADHD, and sensory processing disorders, differentiated instruction, behavioral supports, interventions, and strategies, effective co-teaching, value of inclusion and in creating an inclusive school and classroom environment, and how to partner with parents in their child's education. I was saying earlier how we could have submitted the same testimony 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago. These issues are evergreen and um, just something of note. Thank you. Thank you, our next panelist. Good afternoon, Sherwin Barron. Thank you for sticking it out with us. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to offer testimony on this important subject. My name is Crystal McQueen Taylor. I'm the Regional Senior Director for Uncommon New York City. Um, we operate 24 K-12 public charter schools in Central Brooklyn in school district 16, 17, 18, 19, and 23. Um, I am also a former New York City Department of Education teacher, um, and I was also for several years a program director of the New York City Teaching Fellows Program that have been talked about extensively today. Um, so this topic of teacher education, teacher preparation, um, has been core to my entire professional career um, and is core to the success of our schools and our students. Um, and at every step in my career in education, regardless of program or role, um, regardless of if it's a district school or a charter school, an investment in our teachers and their preparation is one of the biggest commitments that we can make to our students. Um, there's countless research that shows the impact of one high quality teacher and what they can do um, on our students' long-term life outcomes. Um, and too often, teacher preparation, the conversation about teacher preparation is often focused on quantity, the number of hours, the number of classes, the number of sessions, and not enough focus on quality. What are actually teachers learning and what are they leaving those sessions and trainings able to do the next day in classrooms with students? Um, and that does not only happen in graduate programs or in outside professional development, but in the ongoing work of being a teacher um, and getting feedback and continuing to hone practice once in the classroom because teaching is an ever-evolving um, area of practice as you know as your former teacher. 
So in common schools, we are obsessive about studying high quality teaching practice. Um, when there is a teacher who is getting significant results, we flock to that teacher's classroom to study what they are doing well. We record it, we try to codify it, and actually name the things that that teacher is actually doing well that is having results with students. And then we're, we bottle it in a way, um, and then we're able to then um, share and disseminate those practices with other teachers um, through tr trainings and different professional developments that we do throughout the year. Um, our teachers receive about three weeks of professional development, regardless of where, whether they are coming to our schools for the first time or they're returning for their 10th year. Um, before they get into the first day of um, school when students arrive. And then every single week, um, teachers are continually receiving training that is based on what is going on in classrooms and in student work that week. Um, so wherever we're seeing gaps in practice or in student learning, um, they are getting continued development on that every single week. So we're always helping our teachers to hone their practice. And um, in addition to the work that we're doing in our classrooms, once teachers come to our programs, to our schools, excuse me, um, we also have specific programs in place to recruit more teachers of color to join us in the classroom through our Summer Teaching Fellows Program, um, where we bring in rising college seniors um, to do a summer of training with us. Um, where they're able to go through professional development and get some experience in the classroom under the tutelage of a master teacher. Um, and at the end of the summer, they're able to get a conditional offer to actually come back to teach once they graduate from um, college, um, if they decide that that is a pathway that they want to pursue for their professional career. Um, and that has led, um, that has been a significant factor to in in the increasing the diversity of our teaching force, where 52% of our teachers are of color um, across our schools in New York City. So while we're extremely proud of the work that we're doing within our schools, we, um, to serve our ninth days and students, we also know that that's not enough. Um, and if there are things that are going well inside of our walls in terms of teacher preparation, um, we think that it's important, it's our responsibility as anybody who has something good to share it. Um, when I was teaching, often hear the saying that you should beg, borrow, and steal. Um, and we're trying to flip that on the head to say that we should beg, borrow, and just share. So over the past five years, Uncommon Schools has actually partnered with the Department of Education, um, particularly with the Office of District Charter Partnerships and through several of our neighboring district um, superintendents to come together to offer um, professional development and training to over a thousand teachers um, over in the past five years. And the things that we've come together to focus on are not going to be um, of surprise because it's areas that we're always trying to continue to improve for our students. So we've heard a lot about reading instruction. We focused on how to help our emerging readers um, develop foundational reading practices, how to get our middle, um, middle school readers to closely comprehend texts, um, and how to ch continually check for student understanding throughout lessons. Um, and these, the things that we focus on, they're not district or charter issues. Um, these are just um, issues that are important for us all to work on for the benefit of all of our students. Um, and so it is, I think it's critical to continue to find opportunities, regardless of where the practice is coming from, for us to come together as educators um, in service of our students. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this issue. Thank you so much, our next panelist. Good afternoon, thank you so much, uh, Council Member Barron, for holding this important hearing on the issue of teacher preparation and training. Um, my name is Tasfia Rahman, and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. I'm also speaking as a former public education student. I'm a product of the system um, and part of the Asian Pacific American community, specifically the Bangladeshi community. Um, CACF is the nation's only Pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support those in need. The Asian Pacific American population comprises over 15% of New York City, over 1.3 million people. 
and yet the needs of the community are consistently overlooked, misunderstood, and encountered, unaccounted. Um, in concerning um, the education of our young people, we need our teachers well-trained and supported to help immigrant youth who struggle with English language proficiency, the, the pressures of the acculturation process, and the inadequate academic preparation. And despite the Asian model minority myth, Asian Pacific American immigrant youth come from families that face high rates of poverty, live in linguistic isolation, and lack the knowledge of available systems and resources. Um, in the New York City Department of Education schools, one of every one of every five APA student does not graduate from high school on time or at all. Nearly two thirds of APA students in New York City come from homes where languages other than English are spoken. One of four English language learner students are Asian Pacific American. Asian Americans also have the highest rate of linguistic isolation of any group in the city at 42%, meaning that no one over the age of 14 in the household speaks English well. 40% of New York City APA youth are not college ready upon graduation from high school. So with that in mind, um, I, I highlight three um, points of consideration. One, equip teachers with the tools and techniques to better engage immigrant students, but also their immigrant parents, particularly parents of English language learners slash multilingual learners. Many of our parents feel unwelcome, uncomfortable, and often embarrassed to be in school spaces. I know mine were. As a result, they are unable to be as involved in their children's education, even at the classroom level. Because of their limited English proficiency, many parents depend on the children from 12 to navigate the school system. Um, we need to provide our teachers with the knowledge, awareness, and support to be more inclusive of immigrant parents, especially those of our ELL slash MLL students. Two, um, provide more responsive professional development um, in, in response to everyday teacher and student needs rather than solely to fill compliance. Our, students face, our teachers face new challenges every day in the classroom that are not often covered in standard professional development. There are needs, um, there needs to be a way in which teachers can receive training that is more relevant to the unique academic issues their students may be facing. Um, three, more training and support for collaborative co-teaching. Our students, especially our English language learner um, and multilingual learner students and students with disabilities benefit from having more than one teacher in the classroom. However, if teachers are not supported and not given enough time to even adequately prepare and coordinate lesson plans between each other, our students do not receive all the benefits of having multiple teachers. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and we look forward to working with City Council to ensure that our educators have the training and resources necessary to prepare and support our immigrant youth. Thank you for your testimony. Next panelist. Chair Barron, General Counsel, Greg Waltman, representing Clean Energy Company. Um, my family is all teachers and in New York State, the city, and um, just speaking you know, kind of in, in uh, lockstep with my colleagues here, it, it seems that the, the problem with newer teachers and assimilating them into um, uh, needs schools it, it is one of creating opportunity, um, whether it be monetary or financially based incentives to keep, you know, and retain teachers. Not, not just teachers to get, you know, get to get to tenure and then allow for different types of financial based incentives to create um, exceptional um, faculty and staff. And again, um, creating pilot programs to retain the type of talent necessary um, would be another fiscal and budgetary concern of the council. And again, we remain steadfast in yesterday's comments pertaining to asset origination, pertaining to solar contracts. Um, private and partner, uh, excuse me, private and public uh, partnerships to create the type of fiscal opportunity for those types of pro pilot programs to become accessible. So with that, I thank you. Thank you. And you're the troopers who stayed here and hung in and gave us your testimony. We do appreciate your presentation and uh, you can be dismissed, thank you so much. And with that, there being no other indicators of testimony to be giving, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>